survivors and welcome to First Aid Spray, a Resident Evil podcast by fans for fans. This is episode 80 of the show in which we return to our sub-series on specific characters with the dark legacy of Resident Evil's biggest baddie. Its profile, Albert Wesker. My name is Cy and joining me on the panel this week, seven episodes, wait, 70 episodes, wait, 79 episodes in counting. That's all the time he has to podcast with you. It's Firebutton Steve Valance. Hello, everybody. And our guest for this episode, you could say he's a ghost of the fandom, back to haunt this show from the Resident Evil podcast, It's Rombi. Hello, everyone. First Aid Spray is recorded in front of a live Discord server audience, so join now to hear the show early and unedited, and to become part of our wonderful little community where we discuss life, the universe, and Resident Evil. You can find the server and all of our social media links at our website, fasprayPod.com. That's where you can find our merchandise store and our Patreon page. First Aid Spray is nothing without our supporters. Tiers begin at just $1 a month with a host of benefits. Head over to patreon.com forward slash fasprayPod to support the show. Uh, on that note, quick bit of how housekeeping in terms of the new content uh, patreon exclusive or patreon early access i should say to the latest episode of a moment of relief which is the resident evil 4 vr review uh, a long time coming it comes up in the new i think i say this in this episode but it comes up in the t- news all the time that there's a new vr version and none of us can play it but now i can and i was joined by dan durkin my colleague over at what culture to do a full review of our experience with the classic resident evil 4 in vr so check that out it was a great time and the other episode of a moment of relief that you should be aware of that's dropped publicly now is our discussion on what if resident evil was an animated series what we'd like to see out of it what we wouldn't like to see out of it that kind of sort of thing and also we have a brand new episode out now on youtube for now that's what i call survival horror which is the top 10 tracks from alone in the dark nice and timely that one was um but let's loop back around to our guest for this episode Rombi, welcome to the show first question i always ask everyone is Do you remember, and specifically what was, your first Resident Evil experience? Oh, gosh. Um, Definitely 96. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gosh, if I think about this, I know I've written this before. Um, I, funnily enough, I had seen some of the stuff about the game and not really paid much attention to it. And then I think it was actually after release, I was uh, in a store, an electronics store, and I saw... A guy, he's very loud, <laughs> yelling at the uh, cast, the, the the service system, uh, operator at the store about the game he was playing. And I saw him controlling Chris in the upstairs of the dining hall. And I remember him going like, "Wow, the graphics are great, and this looks amazing." And uh, it was very loud. <laughs> and uh, I remember looking at it going, "This looks dull as crap." Like, what is he doing it's like the guy's spinning in circles and i didn't see i didn't see any of the monsters i didn't see anything i just saw this guy walking around this mansion and i was like wow that looks terrible and then a day or two later i was at a went around to a friend's place i was still a teenager at that point and after school and i uh, he was like oh my brother rented this game it's amazing uh you have to see it um he, he, he liked it so much. He rented it last night, like overnight, and he, he liked it so much he went to the store and bought it today. Wow. Like, oh, wow. Sounds really good. So we go and sit down, and it's this game. And I was like, oh, it's this game. I've seen this. It looks terrible. Like, and he said, no, 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 it's really good. It's really good. And I was like, all right. And so he started it up. Like, I'd seen this the, the thing. It was like an opening cheesy v, uh, opening scene. And I'm just like, oh, this is in that era where, like, you know, almost every game had, like, FMVs and stuff. But I, all of a sudden was just like, oh, yeah, that style was at least kind of entertaining. It's like a hokey B movie. All right, maybe mm. I'm on board with this. And then it gets into the stilted dialogue, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know... I, I watched him play it and then we got to the zombie. I was like, oh, okay, so this is what it is. This is, mm. there's, there's enemies and you're fighting. I was like, okay, much more interested. And uh, and we sat there for like a few hours and just played. Um, yeah, I went and uh, rented it out. And the irony is back then, like, you know, obviously I didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't have a memory card. <laughs> so I would just play it and then die. And then it was like, okay, cool, I've learned what I can do for puzzles and stuff. And I'll just try and get further. And, and I eventually beat it without a memory card wow. just by like having to repeat it over and over again. So, 
uh yeah it was it was it, it, for me i was so obsessed and and all my friends they were like you're the, i became the resident evil guy like mm-hmm. they were i was obsessed with it and i was obsessed with the franchise and i started following the news so yeah i could i could wax lyrical about a million other things related to <laughs> that but that's probably the best example but i mean that's what led me to doing websites very early on well you was gonna be my next question is yeah it's funny to hear you go from a you know negative first reaction to oh i'm actually obsessed with this and yeah becoming one of those early adopters of you know fan sites at the time not to poo poo the way the internet is now but it's not it's very different where everyone has social media pages and you might have Mm. your own resident evil themed facebook group or whatever in this but but back then it was just like on the internet oh i found a website which is just full of people that love the same thing i do and i remember your website among many so how did sort of that come to be oh gosh that's a long that's even longer story um (laughs) how much time have we got this is this is why i'm on for four four hours you know (laughs) um yeah so uh that was that was really weird uh i again i was at still at school i um i we had a a, an internet class and I, i kind of just like using the internet and i was obsessed i got very quickly obsessed with the internet and i was like this is cool i love that you can pop anything and of course i was obsessed with the franchise at this point and i think it was yeah it was 97 so you was expecting news on the sequel which mm. uh was what which ended up being the 1.5 version and um so i'm like looking over this and i start seeing that people that are fans start making you know the, this is the era of the geo cities websites and uh, <laughs> um Angel you know Fire. like Angel mm. Fire and mm. uh, Zoom and uh, a bunch of others <laughs> that you get free hosting for ads. Well, even in some cases, it wasn't, it wasn't even ads. It was just free hosting. Mm. But you had unwieldy website addresses. I remember like that. GeoCities and Angel Fire ones always had like weird server names. And yeah, yeah. They were very hard to take note of. Um, but there was a few big sites uh, in, the, in like kind of 98, as it comes to 98, there was a few big sites that were actual under actual domains that people had paid for. One was Evil Online. There was um, uh, there was New Evil. There was um, uh, Evil Gaming Net and a couple others that all kind of came up through the 98 and then even into 99. And there was a guy also who was trying to do a survival horror one. And I kind of jumped on board with that. I, I was like writing news and doing bits and pieces for that. But I could only, I was beholden to how much he wanted to put up. And then I was on forums and looking at this thing with, you know, how people were opening their own sites. And then a friend of mine had a sub-site on another domain and said, look, I can just set you up with one if you want to run your own site. Um, the irony is I actually did a Silent Hill website before Resident <laughs> Evil as well. Like I nice. I created a Silent Hill website because I was like, there's too many Resident Evil sites. And, I, mm. you know, I was just as interested in Silent Hill when that launched in 99. So when I actually finally got around, like I tried making, actually this is a back, I'll backpedal. I tried making a Resident Evil site in 98 and um, it was on a free server and then it got deleted. Oh. Um, so I put all this effort in and just lost it. And mm. I mean, to be fair as well, the site was absolutely garbage. It was my first ever attempt at ever making anything mm. to that scale. And so it would have been terrible anyway. Um, but I did the Silent Hill site and then I was like, okay, I can do the Resident Evil one now. And nice. what my breakthrough was, was in... God, it would have been 99. The Yahoo was the big search engine. Google wasn't a thing. You've got to also remember this is no Google. So the way Yahoo worked in those days is that you submitted, that Yahoo would add sites that it knew were trending, but it was mostly user submitted. So you would submit in uh, your site. So I submitted my site, the Resident Evil one, and it got listed and it ended up on the front page. Like when you search wow. Resident Evil, just as keywords, it was on like the first mm. four, one, four, one of the first four or five entries. And the hits just went through the roof. I just started getting visitors and emails and comments. <clears throat> and then I was like, well, how can I leverage this into the community that I really enjoy? Because I wasn't, I just wanted a bit about my site. Um, I liked all the other sites around. So I made a link list basically um, called RE Sites. And I started putting other websites to make a, like a community. Mm. And um, that thing blew up too. Like I just mm-hmm. couldn't believe it, how quickly that blew up. And all of a sudden we were, it, there was dozens of sites went up to like, I don't know, 70 or 80 different people kind of submitting sites. And I had people submitting all the time. 
and um, you'd have to look over quality and make sure they hadn't just stolen everyone's other stuff from other websites because this is the other thing that I take for granted these days is that it's so easy to put content on line now yeah it was it was not in those days Mm -hmm. everyone had the same photos everyone had the same content you know you had to write original content Mm -hmm. um a lot like i know that sounds ridiculous because everyone still writes original content but you really had to just focus on being unique and having a unique voice um so i really focused on news i really focused on and and the site that i opened was called new blood but i only really looked at the new and upcoming games um Mm -hmm. eventually that that kind of stopped because i realized you can't they're not always going to be new eventually they're going to become old they're going to release and then so i was like i'll just start retroactively adding the old games um and i ran that for a few years and then at the same time i was good friends with rudy at resident evil fan mm. and the same time i was looking like my site was going to have to go offline because a hosting i went through a period where i was actually paid for a hosting for hosting the site in a, a for a u.s company um and i did work for them for for about 18 months two years and the net bubble burst so no one was getting paid anymore like the the margin just dropped off and then they were like we can't host you so i swapped around a few hosts for a while and then just realized the hosting costs were just so expensive Mm. and he was looking at closing his site because he couldn't he didn't have the ability to maintain running it so we merged the sites and that ran for another seven or eight years yeah and then eventually i just we, we couldn't keep it up and running anymore neither of us just had the time or the or the sometimes the passion when you got to like something like resident evil 6 you kind of went mm. <laughs> yeah totally yeah yeah that's so that's the, basically that, in a nutshell that's the one that i remember definitely is uh the combination site of the two absolutely i don't know if i mentioned to you offhand about this before but yeah like going on to i probably did the same thing that like you just said like literally put resident evil into yahoo or ask jeeves or whatever and uh yeah i already found a new blood was spat back out at me and i just remember not being necessarily a poster but a lurker and of the forums and stuff like that being like oh my god there are that, other that, people out there that love all that and <sighs> being exposed to a bunch of games that i knew existed in resident evil i hadn't played yet i was like here's all the artwork and stuff and mm. little sort of you know location guides and all the lore and stuff and i was like okay there's a whole thing to this i wasn't even aware of because i just played like <laughs> resident evil 2 at this point so yeah Big, big, uh... and that, and and that's the thing. That that that, that forum was a wild west. It really oh, was. Yeah. I <laughs> I had a very contest. <laughs> yeah, yeah catching contest and some of those posts. The um the forum I had at, at, at uh, the fir- former version of New Blood was uh, very different. Um, it was a very more I don't want to say insular community, but it was a very particular mindset of mm. like very passionate people that weren't i would almost say crass because crass isn't the right word but they had a very particular focus i think it's like the equivalent of like the general audiences you'll see now in a in a facebook group like you mentioned or like Mm -hmm. the sort of comment section on a on a on a big video you know of someone's is very different than say the sort of thing you would get back in the day on a forum or a discord where people will very much talk specifically in certain areas about you know here's the law here's the plots they want to theorize and all that very different Whereas, whereas I wasn't quite used to that sort of mentality. I, I just didn't realize how big that site was. Mm. It's it's so funny to think about it now. Like, I look at like how the, some of the biggest people covering the franchise are, and like it's all about driving content and stuff. I didn't think about those back in the day. I didn't no. think about it. I just wanted to make a website that was about the thing that I could share with fans, that fans could communicate. Um, we could post up news and it just kind of naturally grew and I'm kind of glad I had that experience when I did because yeah like it makes it makes me I know it sounds really maybe it's just a bit crass in some ways too but I don't really care how big the podcast I'm involved with is to a mm-hmm. certain degree that the other guys sometimes can get a little bit like oh I wish we were doing a bit better or you know this is doing better than we expected really weird or whatever whereas I'm just like I'm glad to just be in and making content and yep. um if anyone listens to it I, I i get to enjoy that because i don't i'm not i'm not i've had my period of time where i was at the peak that i wasn't even trying so mm. why stress about it now yeah totally yeah you've got a, definitely a broader perspective on that for sure um just to wrap this up and i realize we've got a lot to cover so i did want to <laughs> like <laughs> i did want to at least give you a chance to plug the other thing like you mentioned the resident evil podcast there and all of our fans yeah. Hopefully we'll be very aware of that show because, you know, we're very much affiliated with you guys and have jumped back and forth and stuff. But also you're involved with the upcoming documentary about George Romero's uh, Resident Evil script as well. That's right. 
Yeah, correct. I um I I'm co-writing on that script, um, and the film is now finished, and I think it's awesome. just going through its review process with the plans to have it out this year. Um, Brands actually heading onto the uh, Pennsylvania Creature Fest, um, and he'll be screening I think 20 25 minutes of the film upcoming. Um, it that's been a journey. Mm-hmm. Like I I never expected this. Um, so I did. I this is this is not my claim to fame i so nobody nobody be angry about this i was the person who put the final version of the script online in 2001 2002 i forget when it was yeah there's not not a great sign that the person who's like doing this currently <laughs> has forgotten what year um but it, it's just that that there's a lot of happened that year i've got i've actually got the date specifically i found the file i was hmm. doing my research i found the file um that all happened through a very long story with a news group. Uh, someone had a copy of the script, and then we managed to get it scanned, and then I had to clean it up in script format. Now you can find, I mean, it's all, you can, yeah. so my copy of it's archived and everywhere. Um, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, I did not make George very happy about that. <laughs> um, I had no idea about that until I started doing this film. Um, it is not something that's covered in the documentary, so um, I, will, I will say that now. Um <laughs> Uh, but I, but but I, but I was a fan. I mean, that was mm. the thing. I was a fan of Dawn of the Dead. I was a fan of um, his works. Otherwise, his horror movies. I was a big fan of um, Martin and um, Monkey Shines and a few others. So I was very much like, oh, I can't believe he, you know, didn't get the opportunity. And I read the script and I was like, yeah, it's not perfect, but it's pretty pretty good and at least it felt faithful you, you i mean even now we struggle to get faithful video game movies in the 19 you know in the late 90s that was near impossible yeah but the closest we'd had was mortal Kombat, and you could say yeah. that it was basically just into the dragon with mortal Kombat combined yeah. so uh i i had been involved with that then 10 years later i i just i don't know what kicked it off i got a real bee in my bonnet about anderson's films coming near the end and just how they continue to make this franchise that really didn't um fit like i don't mind them i don't like i don't hate them i don't hate anderson i don't have any issues but i just was like they felt like such a missed opportunity mm-hmm. and at the same time i was doing a kind of a dive into other f- video game films to kind of figure out an idea i was th- thinking about doing a a, a, a a written series and i kind of did um kotaku had a uh, talk amongst yourself forum thing yeah. and i did a bunch of posts about this um but uh, it, it kicked off an article idea for f- tracking the history of the Resident Evil film franchise. And then I was able to talk to Yamo at Biohaze, and he was like, yeah, you should put it up. I had a few other people in, put their input. I did a lot of research. And one of the things that came up uh, was uh, the old the Horrors Alive forum. Someone mm. said, hey, did you know that um, the McElroy script was reviewed in an issue of PSN? And I had no idea about it. So I found the information. They told me which issue it was and gave me some of the details around it and i managed to find a copy of it and i added in a story and i credited them that person was bran didn't know this at the time mm. and uh he shoot forward seven years and he contacts me out of the blue he somehow manages to find out how to contact me um and says i've got this idea about doing a youtube video and it's just going to be about romero's script and you got to think that i think there's a few now out there if you do a search on google, on google yeah, or whatever sure. there's a few people covering it but at the time no one had and so the idea was that and then as we're doing research and as he's talking to people he lives in pennsylvania so he's very much close to the core romero group who worked with uh, worked with george a lot in the past um they they started getting wind of this and a couple of people were like you could turn this into a documentary and all of a sudden he comes back to me and goes yeah i'm thinking about turning it into a like full feature length <laughs> documentary and i'm like a uh, what <laughs> okay and this changes the scope because you know at this point i'm just writing notes and going back through my original research and kind of planning out like a half an hour 40 minute script and all of a sudden it becomes you know 90 minutes 100 mm-hmm. minutes something mm-hmm. around that so yeah very much and it's been a long process so that started in 2017 2018 i forget now it's been a while um and it's just grown and then when i see the footage i just can't believe how good it looks yeah. like i just just for for like the the whole scope of its change it got bigger then it got smaller it's gotten wider we've got interviews from all over the place um the you know just it's it's a very interesting scope and i'm i'm very happy to, to see it progress and every time I was seeing an update it's just like holy 
crap. So I'm enjoying it just on that level because all I've done is help write some of it <laughs> um, and do the research. So I, I'm hoping everyone will enjoy it. And for people who know the story, I think they'll be like, cool, this is good to see it like presented. Mm. Um, and for those who don't, they'll get to learn um, you know some stuff that they yeah. would not have expected. So yeah, the trailer came out a little you know ways back and it looked awesome. So great uh, sort of first signs and uh, yeah, I'm sure we will mention it again at some point in the future or we'll cover it perhaps on the channel. We'll just you know make sure people are aware that it's out there and that kind of thing because very much looking forward to it. Cool. Okay, uh, let's get into the recent news if you could, Steve. <laughs> It's going to pale in comparison to what Rombie's done back in day, <laughs> but, yeah, just, just listening to all this, just it's like taking me back to, geez, I would have been tiny. And the amount right. of websites I've gone through, yeah, the, the amount of people you don't realise you've got encountered over mm-hmm. the years. Uh, so my humble condition, uh, adding to the news, is uh, our first story. Uh, <laughs> surprising nobody, Resident Evil 4 Remake has now hit 7 million sales. Yeah, I guess surprising nobody. I mean, it's the biggest game in the series in some ways. Um, so, in a sense, it's also the biggest remake. Uh, so, this puts it, I think, just outside of the top 10 best selling Capcom titles. Um, so, it's just pretty good for about a year. Um, I imagine it's only going to grow and join sort of some of its RE Engine brethren higher up the the order as we go but uh yeah massively impressive strong start steve any thoughts more than just yeah of course <laughs> i mean yeah of course no no <laughs> honestly like it's it's always cool to see because we may or we or may not disagree on which is the better version of resident evil 4 it's still good that a version of resident evil 4 people like because we'll do with the original version, a bit divisive, a lot more divisive. Sure. I think all of us older people are like, yeah, Marie Force, cool, but I like this one more. Mm. Uh, so generally speaking, yes, very impressed, uh, but I, I kind of want to know what, new, what the new next project is. Um, I'm itching for that news. Yeah. Uh, Rob, any thoughts on Remake 4 being so successful? I don't think it is a surprise, is it? I, I don't think it is. I, I, I think the thing that's perhaps the more interesting is just how fast it's tracking to these sales like it, it continues to sell at high levels and it will quickly become one of the highest sellers of the franchise in the shortest amount of time mm. so um i mean i'm always i've had these i've had these discussions i've had these with alex and neil as well it's like mm. it's hard sometimes to track some of these things um because you have to quantify that the rate you mark these things like if you actually added up all the versions of say Resident Evil 5 it's like still oh, yeah. one of the most selling you know but if you track individual releases then I mean Remake 4 is not going to be perhaps that issue because it's it seems like it's one release and I think now they're counting gold editions because technically it is still the base game just with a DLC code yeah. so whereas back in the old day gold edition was a separate tracking marker so Mm -hmm. because it was a physical disc with the dlc included so um that that helps too because if they had split the gold edition sales out then it would be its own thing and the sales would just mark markedly drop off so Mm -hmm. but that's putting a line in the sand and making it look bigger too in that regard just being able to combine those two so yeah that's fair uh, Steve, second one, even less to say about, but it's probably... Worth I, I mean, you, you say that, I'm still impressed. So, uh, Resident Evil Infinite Darkness, The Beginning, is now available in trade paperback, even in back out beyond miserable places like Middle England, where I live. <laughs> I was going to say why you impressed, but yeah, I know, I've seen it firsthand, that it is it's definitely out there in the wild, because you guys found it. Um, yeah, it's good, it's good that this is out there. We've been car- sort of... Uh, following this for a little while as I said in the last episode we will probably do uh, a sort of review on this at some point but just wanted to make sure there was enough time for everyone to get their hands on it both on the team and also listeners that might want to you know get through it before we talk about it at some point but it is out there now in its complete form I think four five issues now all together yeah cool all right that'll do it for the news I think let's rack into what is going to be a big episode indeed his profile Albert Wesker And now, reading excerpts from Wesker's Report and Wesker's Report 2 in character as Albert Wesker, Mike Young, who you can follow on Twitter, at Cosblade. July 24th, 1998. The freak murder incidents that had occurred in the forest near the mansion started it all. The mansion was Umbrella's secret B.O.W. laboratory, and it was clear that the in-development T-Virus was the cause of the murder. Initially, 
Umbrella instructed me secretively to keep Stars out of the case, but with the heightened emotions of the citizens, Stars had no choice but to move in. That was when my next order was given. Dispatch Stars to the mansion, dispose of them, then report the situation to headquarters so that their combat with the BOW could be used for data analysis, allowing Umbrella a comprehensive portrait of the BOW's combat abilities. From the two Stars teams, I first pitched in the Bravo team, as expected, the top elite of stars gave all they had and became useful sample data. Then following, I geared up the Alpha Team to search and rescue the lost Bravo Team. The members of the Alpha Team also proved their worth, and as expected, many died. It was time to begin executing my plans. In the midst of the whole affair, I could take Umbrella's ultimate bio-organic weapon, the Tyrant, and join forces with an opposing corporation of Umbrella. To buy into that opposing corporation, I would need the actual combat data of the Tyrant. The surviving privileged members of STARS were just the perfect bait. I decided to have one of them play the Judas and draw them to the Tyrant. That Judas was Barry. Barry was the strong, truth and justice kind and cherished his family more than anything. His type is easy to manipulate. I simply took that most important thing away from him. My only miscalculation was the high potential of Chris and Jill but with the family man Barry playing the Judas, the scheme went as planned. Then, the winds turned, unexpectedly. I had to eliminate Enrico, who found out what was behind it all. I used Barry to get to him. After I successfully got rid of that nuisance, I awaited the sample specimen that Barry would bring me in the tyrant's room. I injected the virus I obtained from Birkin in advance. If I made Umbrella believe I was dead, it made it far more convenient to sell myself to the opposing corporation. According to Birkin, the virus had profound effects. It would put my body in a state of temporary death. It would then bring me back to life with superhuman powers. Therefore, I unleashed an awesome tyrant from its slumber and let it attack me. As my consciousness faded away, I was certain that the whole scheme would end in success. Never did I imagine that stars could slay the evil creation. I lost the tyrant, and the plan I devised, which cost me my humanity, ended in failure. Now, anyone or anything that stood in my way would be terminated. It's been that way for a long time, and it always will be. At all costs, I had to make stars pay. So, we were always going to come back to the Profile series. It's been a while, but there was always a plan to come back for at least one more episode, which of course had to be Albert Wesker, the biggest bad guy in Resident Evil, as I said in the intro. Um, but it was kind of a matter of waiting for the right time. I think the right time has arrived now that we've had Remake 4, which we knew would bring back Wesker, and separate ways even more so. Um, so, yeah, it seemed like a great time to get into it. So, that being said, as usual, with our Profile episodes... Uh, these are somewhat supported by the Resident Evil podcast in the sense that their wonderful website uh, with the encyclopedia and the timeline, a lot of what I'm going to read in between the entries that we're going to talk about, because we're going to go through canonical Wesker appearances, there are a lot of background lore and stuff. So I'm going to be reading um, excerpts from that. I say excerpts, the first one's a million paragraphs long, so please bear with me, uh, <laughs> because there's a lot of background lore. Um, so obviously, shout out to all you guys uh, for all your hard work. We do it every time. But it's worth saying as well, because it is the best place to go when you need to know any background history on pretty much anything in Resident Evil. So with that out of the way, then please bear with me as I read through the background information for Wesker to take us to our first uh, point of discussion. Very little is known about Wesker's backstory, <laughs> would you believe it? In the 1960s, Albert was just one of many children born from intellectual parents that were collected by Umbrella. They were all rebranded with the surname Wesker after the chief researcher leading the project under the classified instructions of Spencer. The Wesker children plan was born of Spencer's personal vision of creating his own brave new world and ruling over a superior race of human beings. Albert was designated as Test Subject 13 and placed in a subliminal training program designed to indoctrinate Spencer's values into his personality subconsciously. Following this process, he was placed into a controlled environment under the watchful eye of Umbrella and was soon recognised as one of the most gifted Wesker children. In 1977, it was arranged for Wesker to begin work at Umbrella's training facility alongside Birkin, who became a rival, a friend, and together the two of them became the best candidates at the facility. Whilst James Marcus, who led the facility, trusted 
trusted them, they were working more directly with Spencer by spying on Marcus and eventually assassinating him in 1988. The callous murder of Marcus at Spencer's request planted doubts in Wesker's minds about the level of trust in their relationship. If Spencer was willing to dispose of a longtime friend and colleague for personal gain, then he believed he too would ultimately be expendable. This meant that as early as 1998, perhaps Wesker began to make secret preparations for life away from Umbrella. Throughout the 80s and the 90s, Wesker became an important member of the Arclay Lab before finding his ceiling as a geneticist and transferring to the Information Department. He also joined the US Army around this time and gained firearms training. As Umbrella slowly extended their influence within the Raccoon City Police Department, their funding, their funding contribution towards the new STARS unit allowed them to influence key recruiting positions. In 96, they had Wesker installed as the team leader, and he immediately began conducting counterintelligence operations for Umbrella. However, as the T-Virus began to leak around the Arclay Forest, the STARS had to be called into action against Umbrella's original plans of keeping them at bay. Wesker feared that the leak and Umbrella's X-Day plan of cleansing the area Area could expose the company's illegal biological weapons program to the wider public and so he made plans to defect to a rival competitor which brings us as close as we can really get to Resident Evil Zero which is our first talking point. Um, I feel like there's a bit of an ebb and a flow here where some of these are going to be quite a lot and some of these are going to be not a lot because Resident Evil Zero it's basically two cutscenes I think and two cutscenes in a flashback I suppose um, so there isn't a lot to get from this but we're going to talk about how we feel about Wesker in this game regardless and how he's presented portrayed of course by Richard Waugh. Uh, Steve how do you feel about Wesker in Resident Evil Zero? I actually really like him uh, he's got like two maybe three scenes but it's, it's the, there's a more taciturn and uh, restrained nature to him generally speaking like even mm. when the entire squad gets annihilated who are on the train it's like what happened there's no big drama there's no like you know punch the screen in anger it's just oh oh dear <laughs> uh, 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 and the surprise that mark is just who are you is not nothing nothing too scenery chewy mm. generally there's that there's that modest bit of rapport where i think it's when wesker's basically go oh well i'm gonna go do my original plan then see you in a bit burks <laughs> uh, you know and yeah, to paraphrase, uh, and then Birkin does his, oh, well, I'll do this, this, and this then, and Wesker responds with nice, cool, calm silence. Yeah, yeah that's friendship right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, the closest person in, in Albert's life, and he can still barely emote to him, but, but I appreciate the cold demeanor. And it's like only two, three cutscenes, and it's just like, yeah, no, that's, that's all right. I like that. Mm. It's also really good because obviously Birkin being a very panicky paranoid kind of character i almost feel like they amped both up on purpose just to show that complete divide of you know practical owl and scholarly wheel or whatever it was um yeah wesker being non-reactive to birkin who's just kind of freaking out about anything that he doesn't know or can't understand which uh is great i think was portrayal here is not his best it feels a little bit disjointed and robotic for my take um but the actual writing and what they have him do works for me and i would say that despite this being a very minor appearance um this probably is the best connective tissue between resident evil zero and resident evil one because obviously notoriously resident evil zero much debate about whether it's a good prequel or not because the intention was to cover bravo team or at least we thought it doesn't really happen so much at the very least here we have wesker being a character that carries from one game into the other and sort of sets up X day and the stars going in and that kind of stuff. So in terms of actually tying those stories together, it's probably the best bit they've got. Rob, what did you make of Wesker in Zero? I was about to say the exact same thing. I think that the, 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 the consistency of between uh, Zero and the 2002 remake that, that really works for that character. It feels like it's definitely the same person mm. and he's got this kind of calculating coolness to him um it, yeah it's fleeting but he, it feels like he's always just kind of there in the background as well i don't yeah. know if, if that if that is a thing for everyone else but it's it, it just feels like he he has a presence that exists and you know i mean it helps if obviously you know what's going to happen mm -hmm. through playing resident evil but um yeah i do like the the difference between the two of them that you've already mentioned as well it's it's a it's a nice touch and it just feels like still he's manipulating the situation too a little bit, which is mm. great through through those reactions. 
it, it continues his character and that sort of style. I I think the only question I've ever had, and a lot of people have said that, is just like how he gets all over the place in the time frames yeah, well. um, between this and the and the and the set without people realizing. And he's he's here, and then he's in town, obviously, to fly out to the mansion, and then like, it's a lot of effort. Yeah, it's all- Laugh. A lot of effort for for the for the payoff that doesn't quite go as planned, but still has, manages to make it work for his own benefit. So all so those uh, magical elevators we didn't know about. Yeah. There's more than just the one. You oh see. yes, That's elevators, cool. cable cars, yeah. sheds. Oh my! <laughs> yeah, they're all interconnected. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah, you, it's funny because you say about you know continuing, and you're right in terms of sort of from a player perspective. But as a first appearance in the law, like it does work really well because we do sort of see him as this mastermind overseer guy staring at screens and yeah as you quite rightfully said it sort of sets up his president pres press president of him being a background character um and sort of looking over what's going on because he's introduced fairly early on like his scenes are pretty early into the game it does maybe feel for like a sort of cheap pop for the casual fans are like oh where's he in this but it, it also works because yeah it's like right now we're in like we're setting up the background law it works like it, it it didn't need to be perhaps any more than it was they probably could have not had it at all when it wouldn't have made a huge amount of difference but for the law nuts and to see him interact mm. with Birkin, i think for the only time in the series that we actually get to see that on screen it's cool i like it cool I think. besties <laughs> besties hashtag besties probably gonna do it for zero to be honest there's not a lot more to say um but nah. handily our next event is literally the next day of course which resident evil the original game we'll start with the 96 version and then we'll flip over the 2002 so obviously at this point we get the mansion incident as we said we've gone back to town with wesker we've come back in to search for bravo team everybody's split up and wesker goes mysteriously missing kicking off which other scenario, both scenarios, all scenarios, the hidden scenario we don't know about that actually is canon, so on and so forth. Wesker, portrayed in Resident Evil 96, of course, by Pablo Kuntz, and Eric Prius um, uh, as the live-action actor. Uh, Rob, how do you feel about Wesker's portrayal in the original Resident Evil? I mean, I, I mean, gosh, how do I summarise this in a way that makes sense? I mean, he... You, you you flip between the the fact that you're like it's very weird that the guy who's in charge seems so flippant about what's going on <laughs> and stuff and clear, clearly a big painted bullseye on the back of saying yeah there's the bad guy <laughs> um you know not exactly well um expanded which is something i think the, the remake does a lot better um on some degree but i mean he has the sort of like menace as well which i think yeah. pablo gets really across like as much as you can say about the voice acting wesker is not one of those characters that people will turn around and go wesker's voice actor is not great or think about cheesy lines he said so much he's actually probably the 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 one character who probably stays the most consistent throughout as far as like line delivery and how he presents himself and i think it's a very important result result for how the character is portrayed consistently from that point um he's calculating and calm and cool and very matter of fact and it's a combination of the way the character is written the um simple english that was chosen to be used for the for the english voice actors and the way that it's presented by the voice actors so um those things set up what we have for the character both in writing and style it's um it, his interactions are all re- mostly forced uh, you have to say when you go back and and, and look at it like they're um yeah they're, they're they're all situations where he when he turns up it's just it's either the plot push the plot forward a little bit or add a bit more mystery where something was lulling um but it works it, it makes you go well, what's going on and, and it buys into this bigger umbrella conspiracy that you start to learn about with what's going on in the mansion mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I sort of maintain really that Pablo is one of the more expressive performances of the lot. Like he he has, I wouldn't. I guess range is the word, but like he, he hits the character notes right throughout. Um, mm. Even being hampered by the script in a few places, I do think that I think it's his second line the entire game is a little bit weird. The don't open that door. <laughs> like other door. Than that, yeah. Other than that, though, you're right. Like it's not quite as bad as some of the other characters. Um, but it's funny in retrospect when you look at don't open that door and how he becomes this crazy megalomaniacal 
freak show, <laughs> which we'll get to. It's what a, what a weird character arc. A guy awkwardly says line, <laughs> then yep. is, is a cackling maniac. Um, Steve, how did you feel about the original Wesker's uh, appearance? I'm going to oh, reveal a bit of embarrassing truth now. Oh, okay. Uh, when I, I, I when I was ten, when this game first came out, obviously I, I explained before how we played as a rental. Um, yeah, I was like, oh wow, that Wesker guy looks really cool. Where is he for half the game? <laughs> never twigged. Innocent Steve never twigged until the last moment. Oh no, Wesker's the bad guy. <laughs> Stevie uh, wants to pass his inside. I know. I just thought he was cool. I wanted to play as that guy. You know, and uh, I'll tell you, that reveal when the penny in the, the shoe drops, like, I was blown away. Like, oh my God, he's behind everything. Recontextualize the entire. This is my fight club recontextualize the entire <laughs> game um, but generally speaking like as a, as a older adult you know 20 years on hence it's it's amazing really how much it still holds up for me mm. like i i can appreciate yes everyone's voice acting is a little bit ropey yeah. but pablo's was mostly i think generally strong and the the underlying hint of menace in the guardhouse and then the outright like almost smug but not 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 obnoxiously so when mm. he's got you at gunpoint in the lab mm. i thought we're very strong you know as a at this point kind of comes across as like dennis nedry with a gun he's basically screwing over the company he's working for to get out and make money or at least that's what it's implied to be before everything gets a bit more established in later law yeah. like yeah i could get behind this and he's dead <laughs> I, uh, even as a young guy I was like you know I wanted to write fan fiction of how Wesker survived and stuff so I clearly I had some kind of hint but seeing him dead on the floor from the time and in the power room yeah I was heartbroken for a while so initially yes very impressed uh, blew my mind somehow with the obvious turn that he's an evil villain mm. uh, but yeah no I had a lot of a lot of fondness for RE1 96 Wesker I was actually gonna. That was gonna be a question that I put to everyone. So I'm glad that you got there before you know it needed to be done. But I was going to ask about how people felt about sort of his the way his story ends, quote unquote, in this game as it was originally planned. You know, as the villain sort of hoisted by his own petard in some some ways, especially in some playthroughs. You know, where he gets killed by the tyrant specifically. Um, and it's really interesting to me because when you think about it, I mean, obviously it makes no sense but if Resident Evil 1 was somehow not the first game in the series and they made it now he would be the not just smiling cackling villain but he would be the monster at the end as well wouldn't he like he would be the yeah. tyrant he would infect mm. himself that's just the way the games go now so it's it, so interesting it would be Res Resident Evil 5 that's precisely that's... like and now it's really interesting to look back on this and being like he's a villain and then he gets jobbed off by his own creation but you, you don't get to engage with him like in a fight or anything like that he gets taken out by the actual, quite literal monster this time around. Um, Rob, do you remember it at the t at the time? And this is going way back, so I expect possibly not. Do you think that was it for Wesker? We were done, like because obviously we didn't find yes. out that he was coming back for ages. We were just like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you, you, you're okay to, with that, like, yeah. Yeah, I I remember I because I, I, I to actually to go back a little bit further, we're, we're talking about the um the 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 front of, confront, confrontation scene in the lab, and he's got the gun on mm -hmm. you, and I just it's always the first thing I think of when I think of that game is the the whole sneering when he when he's using Barry for his own ends and Jill's one. I just love that line delivery. Yeah. He's got like kind of kind of a chuckle and a and a like, ha, I can't believe you thought that you know I'm just using mm -hmm. for just brilliant. But the, I remember that hitting me, like, because I obviously played Jill first, I think, by myself. And I I, I was thinking, okay, so what's going to happen here? And when he got killed, I was like, oh, well, that seems fitting. Like, he, you know, it's made sense. Like, phonetically, the whole, the monster, the monster that he was craving the data from ends up killing him from yeah. his own hubris. That works really well. And so as far as I was concerned, he was dead. And then when I found out that, you know, in the other endings where um, the tyrant doesn't come out of, the the enclosure he dies still from the power down in the power thing from yeah. being attacked so i was like yeah he's dead and yeah. to the point where i remember even years later i mean i i still don't know the veracity of it like people keep saying oh well no they always plan for whisker to come back <laughs> but i don't think that's the case mm -hmm. i think i think retroactively after they killed him off like within the first few months of development onto the sequels and 
thinking about turning this into a franchise. I think they've definitely said, regretted it, and went, oh, we'll just make it seem that case. But I would guarantee you in 95, 96, when they were working out the story, he was just supposed to die. Absolutely. It was never an intent to be that. There are people out there that argue, oh, well, such and such creator said this later. And I said, yeah, I think that's probably true because I think in retrospect, they realized they made a mistake by doing it. But I think at the time of release, there was never any other thought on it. It was just he was he was the bad guy and he was going to die. Like. <laughs> So yeah, very very interesting. Uh, for me, I've had a very long history of that question. Of course, yeah, no, completely. Like you, of course, not just this fact that it was written as a one-off, like it's a standalone story that you could say that about any time. But around the time the game was developed as well, Capcom were in a weird place, and this was kind of an mm. experiment for them, of course. So oh, it just- almost got cancelled oh, exactly uh, the, I was going to say game it was, was on the chopping block not, at one point and I had to argue yeah. for it to be saved didn't they and it wound up yeah. basically saving Capcom financially from Correct. ruin um, yeah. and it was such a risk like from a genre perspective and from the fact they weren't used to making 3D games that there's a high chance this game would have failed so if they had left a sequel hanger open it would have been kind of pointless so why not you know close everything off and make just a satisfying experience so I'm completely with you like if you're just playing Resident Evil 1 He's dead. He's not coming back. So, yeah. Um, other points, completely agree with what you guys have said about he's very cool and under control. Up until, for me, there's obviously the point where he gets laughed at. That's kind of when it cracks. When Chris yeah, laughs and says, you're pitiful. That's when he gets a little bit upset about it. He's like, how dare you? Uh, you don't understand this, you idiot. I'm going to unleash this thing on you. You're done. You're done for now. But it almost gets his hand forced a little bit there. He probably was going to do it anyway. But now he's acting out of vengeance, and there's a sort of crack in the veneer there when Chris laughs at him. I love that. It's always been a great moment. And one of my other moments mm-hmm. I love from this game when it comes to Wesker is when you bump into him in the guardhouse. I think it is, and he just lies to the player basically um, when you're playing as Jill specifically. And they ask, you know, where's Barry? And, oh, I was just with him when we got split up. It's, that might not necessarily be true, but he doesn't want you to think that he's walking around by himself because that's suspicious because he's totally fine. So he's like, oh, yeah, I, I was I was with them. It was fine. We were up to stuff. I wasn't up to no good, I swear. <laughs> I love that. Um, and obviously we'd, we'd covered the, the book, Umbrella Conspiracy, at some point, which made a great, like, little diversion on this where he's, like, tucking into rooms and working on stuff in the background and stuff, which I really liked as an addition to this, a kind of perspective on what Wesker was up to during this time. But, yeah, big marks all around. Wesker is a high point of the original Resident Evil, I think that's fair to say. Um, Let's flip over then to the 2002 rendition of the very same story and see how we feel that it compares... Uh, this time, Wesker portrayed by Peter Jessup in his only appearance as the character, as is the case with many of the Resident Evil remake voice acting crew. Um, Steve, how did you feel about Wesker in remake by comparison? Genuinely impressed at the time. Like I, as we all know historically, am not the biggest fan of Code Veronica um, and that version of Wesker. But in in this case, seeing them come back and they're cool, collected and scary. Kind of a lot more menacing. Less uh, young Steve being impressed. More slightly old Steve going, it's a bit bit scary. (laughs) Uh, And the the way that obviously now we all know how the reveal goes, seeing how it plays out. Uh, The strangest thing for me is that whenever whenever Peter Jessup is in any other roles, uh, like, for example, Paladin Dance in Fallout 4, I still just hear Wesker from him. <laughs> like, I think it's be- mostly just his speaking voice, but the general tone to it, uh, it, it's, it resonates, as this is what I think Wesker should sound like, at least from this game. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, unsuperpowered. Uh, I think my standout scene is still probably the confrontation, uh, specifically with uh, Chris and Rebecca, because, like, the, the way that he coolly just e- oh, executes, in quotation marks, Rebecca Chambers, yeah. and then don't move. Like every veneer, any any facade he had just evaporates, and it's like he's gone from being quote unquote a boss to um, just a calculating psychopath at that point. Yeah, that mass drop does it for me. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Again, like that is probably going to be the scene that we talk about the most in this game, like it was the last one. I think that it's really well sh- sort of directed and framed and shot, if you want to call it that. Uh, no matter which sort of ending you get they're all really cool to look at and there's some really interesting angles and sort of Hitchcock angles and stuff like that going on there and cut the pace of some of those scenes is really cool uh, he's a real piece of work uh, at the end there because he goes through the game 
being very emotionless until the end where he's sort of airy and he's almost joyful watching his plan come together which is which is great because we come to sort of appreciate that as a mark of Wesker's character of being sort of this control freak almost so he's he's blissful uh, because he's made it to this point and he thinks he's won and he gets to take all this data and bog off basically um for me i love jessup's betrayal i think he's great uh there's a little bit of something lacking here and i think it might come from a writing side not a performance thing i feel like there was an opportunity to do a little bit more um i feel like there i just feel like there's more going on in the 96 version interestingly which is all oh, i didn't expect that but on a rewatch of all the sort of cut scenes in preparation for this it was like i'm kind of surprised they didn't add in some extra flavor here um, which yeah, I mean, take it or leave it. I guess it doesn't have Let to be. The best that. you get is a few flavor notes, isn't it? Um, with I've left you some bullets, Chris. Yeah, and various cool. things. There's a Don't waste things. bullets on that lady in chains. Yeah, that bit's like obviously the grab a piece of the action. That's kind of fun. But like when I talked about the guard guardhouse scene in the original, in this it's I don't know. It doesn't seem about Wesker. It seems about other characters. It's it's less focused on how he's kind of suspicious. And maybe that is again because the players know what's coming. So why even bother players know he's the bad guy this game has been out six years i don't know it's not bad it was just an observation that i had um rob how do you feel about uh, peter jessup as albert wesker and uh, the appearance in this game it's funny you, you're talking about the guardhouse scene um one of the things that always rem- i remember sticking out was the way he acts about not being suspicious is more suspicious because of the way he acts <laughs> if that makes sense like it's it's kind of thing like he's because he's kind of so like the way you described it is perfect and i'm just like i remember thinking at the time was just like yeah i see where they're going here but but doing but having him react this way he's i'm amazed the other characters not like you're acting really weird right now. Like you're really trying to draw attention away from what's going on yeah. and yourself. And um, I think that was it. I mean, I mean, in, I I really can never state how much people were blown away by the look of and and the release of that game in 2002. Is a real understatement. Oh, yeah. Um. To even to even like say it was successful, and it's really it frustrates me now when I see people going on about like, oh, well, you know, the remake didn't sell very well and so sort of stuff. Across the board, I don't think people ever complained about it because everything was, as far as they considered, improvement, and that included just having like slightly more rounded characters. Mm-hmm. But interestingly, exactly as you've both said, Wesker ends up being the one that probably goes backwards a bit like everyone else improves everyone else gets a bit more character development a bit more nuance a bit more ability to like with some even map voice acting but wesk is the one that kind of they went with like well this is what wesk becomes later so we need to make make sure he's very withdrawn and very quiet and very um particular and he ends up becoming slightly less interesting and a little bit more bland as you both said because of it it's very odd I've, I've always thought that so yeah it's interesting he got the same take also actually speaking of which we haven't really talked about it so much for the other ones but one of my uh, favourite just sort of character designs for Wesker here like the original was great obviously and this is just a, a better version of that like a high quality version of the original I'd like to mess around with it too much and we'll get back to it I'm sure when we get there but I like the little inclusion of navy blue he's not just all wearing all black like bad guy wear all black is pretty boring so I like the you know his his design here is very iconic I guess I could say for this um okay cool let's add an, a weird one in here because i said we're going to go in canonical order but we're just going to package a couple of ones together that also take place again around the same time period which is umbrella chronicles which uh quite interestingly and uh was kind of a pleasant addition at the time it'll be interesting to see what your guys take on it is now at this point but features some playable wesker scenarios beginnings which takes us from the resident evil zero scenes that we were just talking about uh, up to resident evil in theory and uh, again rebirth takes us from the moment that wesker has quote unquote died at the hands of the tyrant uh, to escaping the mansion so we get to find out how he got out there which surprise surprise he just left before it blew up uh, it's, <laughs> it's not exactly a revelation except you know he has superpowers now which again we already knew but um are these kind of pointless are they benign what did you think of wesker um in, in in umbrella chronicles here getting his own little stories rob uh it was one of those things where i was just like well it may in the construct of the umbrella chronicles itself it kind of made sense yeah. i mean the, the, it was a framing device around whisker and the retellings of these events and it, it filled in some it filled in 
it didn't fill in context that we didn't already know. Like you, you summarized it already very well. Like you, you expected these things, you knew these things, but it was just nice to have these little like additions that mm. kind of flesh out those bits in between. But it is also kind of forgettable if you didn't have them in there. You, 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 it doesn't change the narrative. You still knew what had happened before and after. So yeah, I, I find it a very hard thing to really say too much about. It's, yeah. it, it's fine. It's. Yeah, it's yeah. My really my only note is that it's he's a bit too quippy for me here. I appreciate that this is an arcadey game, so it's it's kind of like that. You're it's a rail shooter. You get a lot of that in general. Character lines just tend to be quips and sort of miniature pieces of direction to keep the player engaged mm-hmm. on what's going on from room to room. Um, but it was a bit much for me. We went from if you you know if you take it super seriously, canonically speaking. We just talked about Remake West for being quite quiet, as you put it, and cold, and maybe a little bit twisted. And then when he gets back after being dead, he's a sort of, yeah, Marvel hero character doing all the quips. Um, And the portrayal here, the actor here does a much better job later. Um, This is just too much for me. It's just too much drawling. Um, Steve, how did you feel about Wesker in Umbrella Chronicles? Okay, uh, personally, uh, it was blowing me away at the time. So, oh, wow, playable Wesker. Sure. In challenge. hindsight, challenge stages that are a bit rough with an overly quippy character. Yeah. Um, I like some of the lines. They've kind of resonated. Like, for example, now I can still hear ringing in the back of the head, just kicking a monster and, that was quite enjoyable. <laughs> uh, you know, that, uh, time to get the virus and get out. You know, it's why does he sound like, to quote Yahtzee Croshaw, like Lloyd Grossman with throat cancer? I'm not sure. <laughs> However, they are very, very much more animated than any other portrayal that we had had at this point. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, we know how he goes later on, but you know, as a more quippy, sarcastic Wesker, it's okay, but mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like it's really in resonant with the character at the time, as you've already said. Generally, though, the, the main selling point for me is the actual encounter with Ada. Like that and yeah. that and I guess the resurrection, but we know what happened there. The the Ada one's the most like, oh I didn't realise that's quite how she escaped. Quote unquote that's question fair. mark. That's fair. And she basically gets blackmailed or threatened by him to, you know, you've got nothing for me and she goes, I've got the G virus. Oh, okay, that changes things. Here's a grapple gun, you'll use it for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But until then, like he's he's just a smug git. Yeah. <laughs> Which fair. is yeah. Uh, again, he taunts Lisa, a woman who he should probably know the entire story of, because he probably was a participant in a lot of those yeah. tortures. Yeah, uh, it's like, yeah, stay dead this time. Ta ta. Yeah, yeah that's a bit. Oh. <laughs> and just we were talking about this on the server. I'm going to bring it up now to emphasise that he's not the, the pivotal villain of the game. They invent one who's kind of rubbish, <laughs> and Definitely it's not the best foil for him. It's yeah. definitely not the worthiest foil for Albert Wesker. Yes, I've got things to say, but uh, <laughs> that's fine. We'll get there. Um, okay, so let's move ahead. Uh, a little bit of lore to join the gap, as I said. Uh, after the mansion incident and his arrival at the hands of Birkin's special T-virus, Wesker worked from the shadows for the rival company. He found success by assisting in delivery of a G-virus sample to them, working directly with Ada Wong, as you've said, Steve. Wesker's successful recovery of the G-virus for the rival company restored his reputation and he began to earn power and influence within the organisation. A few months later, Wesker began to hear rumours of a special awakening. Spy- Eyes on the Ashford-owned Rockford Island had intelligence that the famed Alexia Ashford was still alive. Alexia had been a, re- a head researcher at Umbrella at just 10 years old, but it had been announced as dead in 1983. The rival company wanted Wesker to capture her, and so in late December he launched an assault on the island, utilising their HCF Special Forces team, hence kicking off the plot of Code Veronica. He's obviously a major part of that because... As I say, it's the impetus, really, for the game. The outbreak that happens on the island is directly because of Wesker's actions. And also, let's face it, he's essentially the reason that they made Code Veronica X. Because a lot of the additional scenes, other than changing Steve's haircut, were Wesker-focused. So uh, that's kind of a big deal, I guess. And it's very much used to set up the future moving from that. And that's one of the best things about it for me when it comes to Wesker in this game. Um, we waited all that time we find out that he's still alive um, and then 
They don't rush to a conclusion. They don't go, he's still alive. Now Chris has to kill him at the end of this game. No, he gets away again, uh, which I really, really like to set up a future thing. Um, it's This is the middle point of that sort of Wesker and Chris story, really. Um, this is the beginning of the Wesker's I hate you, Chris, uh, cue debate on what ending of Resident Evil 1 is canon, I guess, because if he hates Chris, it's probably because he ruined the tyrant thing specifically in that scene. But as we know, none of the scenarios can be canon. They all have to occur, but it's an interesting thing nonetheless. But uh, yeah, really important, pivotal moment in, well, all of Resident Evil, but specifically Wesker as well. Uh, Steve, as the Code Veronica lover that you are, <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about Wesker's portrayal in this game? I, I was a bit harsh earlier. I think. Uh, <laughs> but generally speaking, it's okay. It's okay. It's very sheer con, but I think that's what Richard Wall was going for. Mm-hmm. You know, I I just want to backtrack. I think the reason why he's so bitter about Chris is because Chris laughed at him. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say the same thing. I was exactly about to say the same thing. It's, it's all a revenge plot because he laughed at him. <laughs> but uh, going from what the time was, 96 Wesker to this Wesker, you can obviously tell he's gone through a massive character shift. He's not quite as, you know, cool and collected. He's more sadistic and cruel. Mm-hmm. But generally, full mask off, I'm going to be an asshole now, because I can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, he would have probably just kept on slapping Claire around, for example, until someone calls him and goes, yeah, you need to do this, Wesker. Yeah. You've left tea on up. <laughs> And then, it, and then it's disappeared for most of the game until Chris comes around. And then it's like just pure smug git. Mm-hmm. I I think he mm-hmm. it, it, it can't, it can't understand just how much of a fun smug git is because it's rare that you see a villain quite badly pulverize a character, I feel like, with no way of fighting back. You don't ever actually confront Wesker yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't get to fight him. You just get to watch him do cool things like bow, you know, bounce Claire around or smash Chris around mm-hmm. and then he buggers off. Mm. At least in the original Code Veronica, you get to see Wesker get beaten up a bit by Alexia and then he runs away. But you don't even get that in CVX. He he basically goes, oh, well, Chris, you're there. Deal with it. I'm off. Yeah. (laughs) But the big send-off is the big fight at the end. It's strangely satisfying. It's not quite WWE choreographed. He gets like a girder dropped on him. (laughs) But it's still, for the time, like, oh, my God, he's so cool. I'm going to tell you, Steve, that's definitely happened in WWE at least once. Um, (laughs) What, an entire stack of girders? (laughs) I don't know about that. And an explosion. Some rigging. Um, But, yes, it's it's an interesting one for me because at the time, I think it felt like quite a leap of character. But given the full context of what's to come, it isn't necessarily nearly as extreme. This is the beginning of the ha 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 ha, ha I do an evil mm. laugh, you know. Um, but I, you know, it's an okay middle ground if you're looking at it from a, a character arc, if you like. And we'll talk about how we, you know, feel about that when we get to that point. Um, but yeah, aside from the sort of more pantomime villain bits, exactly what I was going to say. We get a really nasty Wesker in this game. He's slapping Claire around and stepping on her and toying with her, which. He, you know, it's what he does with Chris the first time that they bump into each other for the first time um, on Rockfort before they go to the Antarctic base. He's just exerting his power and control and loving it, um, which is great for his character because that's what he's about. He's like, ha, look what I can do, um, which is about right. Um, he demands the virus from Alexia quite boldly. He takes Steve's body just like it's nothing. The only thing that matters to him is his goal. Um, and he admits at one point that he's not even human anymore, which is really cool. He also, I want to say, for my money, has the most expressive facial features in the game. He's got a nice smirk on him. And my favourite Wesker moment uh, in Code Veronica, and right up there of all of them, is legitimately the look of fear on his face when Alexia mutates for a moment. There's just a moment of, oh God, what have I done? <laughs> even though he's not human anymore, or his superpowers... Just sort of something about you know the majesty of Alexia Ashford walking down those stairs and melting into the creature that she is magnificent I think Wesker says uh, yeah I think that's a really cool Wesker moment for me Rob how do you feel about Wesker in Code Veronica oh gosh um, <laughs> controversial one maybe no no well I'm just not a, I'm not a Code Veronica fan either um, <laughs> I'm on my island uh, uh, I have to. I can't. So I have to separate the two between very much between the first release of Code Veronica and Code Veronica X. Sure. Because I and, and not in a bad way, but just because I lived through both. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. totally. <laughs> in the sense that I was covering games at the time. Um, 
it was always interesting to me that they showed that before in the marketing before code veronica came out the whisker was still alive because mm-hmm. i feel like on one hand it wasn't a marketing buzz to have that in there and then on the other hand it would have been really interesting had they not revealed that and he just turned up and everyone was like what yes um it it was such an interesting character because in the the original code veronica he has he is still that same basically just giant jerk um <laughs> with very sadistic and stuff but then they kind of very much not having the end scene with um the confrontation and um having the whole alexia thing play out the way it does his character it feels a little bit disjointed and incomplete so you fully understand why when they went back and read the game they went and added more of that and and kind of tried to justify why he's there because it feels like he had this under control with like whoever's invading the island and it feels like he involved himself not because he had to because he just wanted to for ego reasons Hmm. in in the original version like he he doesn't really do anything if that makes sense everyone does stuff for him he just should not he didn't even have to be there yeah and whereas in the CVX version, he feels like he's a little bit more justified to why he's there, and especially in, re- in regards to once Chris turns up, um, like he's yeah he's toying with Claire, hoping that he will turn up. And yeah, yeah, it, it's it, there's there's more definitely more justification to mm. it. His characterization there is also that case where, and you've you've all alluded to it. Um, the, the, it becomes slightly mega maniacal by the end, you know, like the whole, I, which I love the camera shot of him like spinning around with his arms in the air going, look at the power I've gained. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, it's so over the top, but it's so suitable for the sort of character he, he is. Um, and yeah, I just remember when that, that, ver- those cutscenes, I managed to get them out early. The game hadn't even like, I think the game had released in one territory and someone I knew had a, had a copy of it. Um, nice. So we managed to record it and put them up as real video <laughs> clips, as it was, as was the style <laughs> in 2001. Yeah. Um, and so people were able to watch them. Who, this is the thing, Code Veronica did not sell well in the Dreamcast, mm-hmm. and um, like it, it, it wasn't that it sold well for the Dreamcast and still based, but the Dreamcast just didn't sell at a late level. So a lot of people, the first time they ever played the game was Code Veronica X, and it came out in Japan, I think, before it came out anywhere else. So we got managed to get cutscenes out so people could see the differences um but then a lot of people tend to a lot of people hadn't even played the code veronica at that point so i was like i was like don't watch them if you haven't played it at all it's only if you bought the dreamcast bought code veronica and they're not going to buy the x version that was the point um but yeah i just remember going that was the first time i saw them too i didn't see them in person until a few months later and I just remember going, wow, they've really fleshed him out, but he's still just a real jerk. <laughs> in terms of the performance, uh, it must be said, uh, I just get cards on the table now. I love Richard Juarez, Wesker. Um, and yeah, it's scenery chewing and all. Uh, this is great from him. I enjoy all of it. There's a lot of quotable. And there's, there's an element to it where it's like, we still have the B movie in Resident Evil very much in lots of places. There, are, there are parts where it tries to take itself more seriously throughout the series, or co- sort of come across more seriously, perhaps. But Wesker has always, at this point, been kind of a reminder of not to take things super seriously because he's a ridiculous supervillain who can now Matrix move and all this stupid stuff. And I love Richard's performance of that with this very disjointed evil laugh where each ha is a different syllable <laughs> definitely like, just, uh, oh, 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 yeah, it's so it's so video game of the year 2000 and then you know whatever year cvx uh, eventually came out i i love that about it and i yeah just need to shout that out because i yeah one of my favorite weskers for certain but we'll we'll definitely get into that it's got some well, fun quotables, that's for sure like i despise chris you know all yeah. that stuff it's Little uh fishy gum she my all that exactly stuff. yeah <laughs> although he does have the goldman laugh as you pointed he out he does so. have the goldman laugh rob any stand out <laughs> wesker lines from cv that you love and what we'll, would we'll do uh i oh gosh um <laughs> yeah you've done the fishy hook one i do like that one sure, i do I, the one i just the quoted the look look out the power of uh yeah, what that's become. One. um Oh, there's one other, and I'm, I'm struggling to think. I know there's one other that I've, I've, I haven't seen the cutscenes in a long time. I was terrible at doing research for this, so I apologize. <laughs> That's but all right. I, um, 
I know there's one other and it's not coming to me and I'm just like when this context of it I, I'm with you though the reaction to Alexia in the original and then the cutscene and then the way because I kind of think it played into the fact that he was both um very very much impressed by her but also the, with the original vision got his ass handed to her yeah. um yeah it's, a, yeah, it's that is that you were one of my best men i'll let yes. you handle this yes. or whatever it is yeah yeah mm. yeah it's a great yeah. scene july 27th 1981 today a 10 year old girl was sent here as a chief researcher from umbrella's antarctica research facility her name was alexia ashford I was 21, and Birkin was 19. As annoying as it was, the whole Arclay complex was rampant with rumors of Antarctica Alexia. Nobody talked about anything else. She had been at Umbrella for a long time. The older guys at Umbrella knew the legendary Ashford name. Before, if we ever reached a dead end in our research, one of the old timers would say, if only Professor Edward were still alive. If I remember correctly, Edward Ashford was one of the people who first discovered the starter virus, and who originally planned creating the T-Virus. However, he died soon after Umbrella was founded. It's been 13 years since his death. So is there really anything to gain by having high expectations of the Ashford lineage? And in fact, the Antarctic Research Center founded by his son hadn't yielded a single result. Don't people know the limits of Alexia's smarts? She is only Edward's grandchild, after all. But from the day she came, our worthless, good-for-nothing subordinates begin to say, it's a good thing Alexia is here. She may be from a famous family, carry great genes within her, but nonetheless, I knew it was going to be a real hassle having subordinates with such a lack of good judgment. It's idiots like that, who if they accidentally stuck their foot in a bucket, wouldn't be able to move or figure out what to do unless someone told them. At least I could still tell the difference. However, if at that time I would have gotten upset about the whole thing, it would have just slowed down our progress on the T-Virus research. Unless you can keep cool and still be decisive no matter what the circumstances, then success will always evade you. At that time I was thinking this. By making good use of the past, then we could definitely yield good results. And if some of those old timers who feasibly could die at any second, then they would make great test subjects. After all, do you think it's possible to stand above the people if you can't rationally use their human resource as well? However, the problem was Birkin. The way he reacted to the Alexia rumors was terrible. He never really said it, but for Birkin, the fact that he was the youngest person to ever be a chief researcher was always something he was proud of. That pride was severely injured by having a mere ten-year-old become a chief researcher. It was probably the first time someone so talented as he had ever tasted defeat. He just couldn't accept the younger girl of good lineage to be made a fool by someone who hadn't gotten any results. Someone who had worked so far away. The fact that he couldn't get over it showed his immaturity. Birkin's pace was quickened by Alexia's existence. He began to act out of the ordinary. He would stay at the lab for 24 hours straight, attempt experiments that he hadn't really thought out. I'm trying to use other researchers to get as many samples from the subjects before they died, but I just couldn't keep up with his pace. Wesker resurfaced again in early 2003, where a routine intelligence mission for the rival company led him into the wilderness of Russia. He'd learned of the location of a hidden umbrella storage hangar in a remote village near an old chemical plant. This hangar contained viral samples and BOW specimens frozen in status. He launched an investigation and confirmed a T-virus leak at the location, also discovering that the chemical plant was a hidden umbrella base where the UMF-103 data archive was being held. He quickly banned a mission to steal this. He leaked the existence of Umbrella's base alongside rumours they were developing a powerful new BOW to the Russian government and privately funded anti-biohazard and the privately funded sorry and the privately funded anti-biohazard unit that Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine had linked up with were sent in of course so this is the before the fall I think that's the name of the comic right but also more specifically Umbrella Chronicles uh, Dark Legacy the player, playable Wesker section of that, that we've alluded to earlier so, Steve, since you were there saying sort of points that bled into it, how do you feel about Wesker's little story here? 
I mean, first things first, let's respect the drip. You know, <laughs> the Dark Legacy outfit is great. It, yeah, it's even got a little bit of that blue accent. It's the lining of his, his big fur coat that he tosses off. It's, <laughs> nice. you know, he's, still, he's still got his RE1 somewhere, maybe. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, I, I, Umbrella Zen's very hokey anyway, so it's not really great. It's fun to play as Wesker, even as the most acrobatic boss fight against the most boring Eurovision tyrants. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, generally speaking, oh. though, I think it's more playing as Wesker is cool. The situation he's in is not so cool. Yeah. And unfortunately, as a result, you know, Sergei two first names is boring. It's just... <laughs> I, I can't find him compelling. I, if it had just been the Red Queen that had basically shattered his plans at the end of RE1, quote-unquote, in, you know, in the rebirth scenario, mm. that would have been more fun if it had been an AI taunting him because it's the yeah. one thing he can't really snark against. The robot don't give a damn, you know? Mm. But instead, it's just... Uh, uh, hello, comrade. Uh, I'm going to kill you now. Yeah. Well, Goodbye. I, I, as you said earlier, I, I kicked off that conversation on the server being like, is Sergei the worst character in Resident Evil? Because <laughs> he's right up there. He's, it's not even that he's ridiculous and shoehorned into the law, but he, but more than that, he's just boring. Like, the most obvious bad guy checklist he's got scars he's got silver hair he's russian he's a military guy he's a sadomasochist he's just so dull and the yeah, fact that like, this is built around him does not help not the worthy foil to wesker to fight against mm. like you want some kind of corporate suit who's completely like like irving or something with power that, <laughs> right. that'd be more compelling than yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is uh, we're meant to be talking about more specifically. About, this isn't the you know Sergey hate hour. We're talking about Wesker. Rob, um, how did you feel about Dark Legacy's Wesker? Uh, I again, it's kind of that over the top, overblown thing. I I was never a fan. I have to fully admit too that I've only think I've ever played those scenarios once. I think it was when the Honestly HD fair. collection came out of um, I, I, I think I know that's not true. I played a little bit of um, it on Wii, uh, but I think I mostly played the early stages, and it was because my friend had a copy of the game at the time, uh, and it wasn't until the HD version I actually sat through mm. and played all the scenarios. Uh, so I don't have a lot of memory of that. I, 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 mean, I mean, I have a memory that it wasn't particularly great, and <laughs> what, everything you were saying about the whole scenario in itself, but I, 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 there's nothing memorable in that regard. Like, I'm just going, okay, so they've added Whisker because they've got to, like, tie these narrative lines together mm -hmm. and it's like this just feels like a big i mean this is the same thing applies to the umbrellas end kind of thing as well it's just like it's a big lot of meh mm. <laughs> and so whisker just gets embroiled in that same thing it's interesting too actually thinking about the gameplay thing and how all the times we've played as whisker in this it's not particularly great and then they end up adding whisker in the uh was it the hd version of zero for yeah. the leech hunt thing and that was a much more engaging and interesting use of playing as whisker as I well so yeah i should do that uh, it's, it's 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 fun like mm. it's a it's a it's a very different sort of because you're playing that same third person you know third uh, person camera angle stuff yeah but um yeah much more on point and you know than, than this and without any of the quips so <laughs> <laughs> fair i think you know for what it's worth when it comes to the story here sergey aside i think the idea of wesker stealing umbrella's data to sort of help indict them legally is kind of cool but broadly it contributes to sort of the mess of Wesker's story at this point where he, he's taken out Umbrella so he can restart a, a new Umbrella and it's just like, okay it's a bit odd but sure why not and yeah as I said with the previous Umbrella Chronicles Wesker's probably the worst voiceover portrayal of Wesker in the series here it's a really sticky smarmy mess mumbly kind of weird mix between accents i think again the actor does a better job later but this is a really bad start as a debut for me just didn't land at all and just seems too too silly too mumbly uh at least he looks good it is the re4 outfit admittedly but i think people call it the dark legacy outfit because it got its proper like own little chapter here to, to flourish not that you see it because it's a first person game of course but regardless um yeah He's very flat in this, and I think characters in Umbrella Chronicles across the board just fail to pop. Um, whether it's in new ch chapters or old, Wesker is no different for me. So that's that's Dark Legacy over and done with. 
Uh, let's move forward into the next selection of law. Um, in his escape from the facility, Wesker wipes the entire umbrella network of databases and takes control of their remaining assets, contributing to their final downfall by additionally anonymously testifying in court against them. From here, he leaks the T-virus onto the black market, kickstarting a new era of bioterrorism. Around this time, Wesker began treating himself with the chemical PG67AW to keep mutation via the experimental virus at bay. Additionally, Wesker... Additionally, Wesker began work on anti-BioW weapons so that he had the full ability to shape the flow of biological warfare by possessing the appropriate countermeasures to the BOWs themselves. In 2004, Wesker was in contention to lead the rival company and invited the spy Ada Wong to come and assist him again, having built up a professional working relationship since Raccoon City. Ada accepted the offer, though unbeknownst to Wesker, she was secretly reporting back to the upper hierarchy of the company who were plotting Wesker's removal, citing him as, quote, an uncontrollable spark that could burn the organization from within. The rival company had re-recruited re Ada with the specific purpose of keeping Wesker in check. She began intelligence missions for Wesker, and one of these jobs resulted in her intercepting an email from a researcher named Luis Serra, which led to the discovery of the Las Plagas parasites in southern Europe. Wesker wanted a sample and sent in Jack Krauser, a man who had sworn allegiance to him in years prior, to infiltrate Los Illuminados, the cult who were using Las Plagas. Ergo, Resident Evil 4, Richard Wah back again in the character. This is a... Uh, an interesting uh, Wesker one. This is, like I say, one of the ones that's a bit more minor, perhaps, because he's a bit more of a background character in this. And he's the man in the chair, the sort of evil overseer. He's, you know, the dead man still at this point, uh, hiding in the shadows. Um, so, Rob, how do you feel about Wesker in Resident Evil 4? Uh, well, I, I think before I even talk about that, I have to contextualize to me what that actually entails, because obviously... Sure. The, the the original release of the game was like a burn umbrella to the ground mentality straight yeah. off the bat and and it was a very shocking change so obviously this was all stuff that they kind of retroactively added when they did the expanded world to try and explain what had gone on where it, 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 i don't i don't want to do the where's poochie response to it but it was a <laughs> lot of people in in 2004 going but what happened with wesker like the last we saw he seemed like he was off for world domination and all of a sudden now we've, we've got this game where your umbrella's fallen but wesker's nowhere to be seen mm. so then to have that added back in was was perhaps very interesting in of itself i mean i i i'm not meaning to put the uh cart before the horse but there's a very much also difference between the stylistic thing where wesker is very much a remote man in charge here as opposed to the new version which we'll get to in the mm. remake um which i think kind of works for the mentality of like him even even bothering to hire ada when we know he has these abilities himself yeah. Um, so it feels very much like he's again in control and he's manipulating things through both Jack Krauser and through Ada. Of course, we didn't know that with, with Krauser so much to begin with. You get hints of it, obviously, in the main plot, but you, that could have been anything at the time. It's not until retroactively you realize mm -hmm. what that, what his comments about you know the resurrection of Umbrella basically imply. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, Whiskers is an interesting character, but it kind of feels like, and I, I don't mean any disrespect to how it's pre presented, but that could have been any other person in that chair in some respects, yeah. still guiding the hand of Ada on behalf of anyone. And I don't mean that, yeah, I don't mean that on a level of disrespect. Obviously, from a narrative standpoint, it makes sense that it's Wesker, but it, it, it's not driven by any particular need for Wesker to be in control or him being personally involved, which is one of the things I think they've tried to correct for the remake which is mm. why i mentioned it earlier mm. um that it feels like there's a bit more of a direct line as to why he wants to be involved yeah other than that i can't complain it you know that it's a it's a it's a, it's a performance that it is perfunctory on the basis of it's a man in a seat yeah. commanding <laughs> stuff for a radio yeah. and it works for that basis you wouldn't want more or less it is what it is mm. No, it's a completely fair point. It's obviously important to have that context as we're doing this sort of canon as it is now. But yeah, absolutely, with the with the way Resident Evil is and things get added in later and aren't integrals and all this stuff, absolutely. Um, I do like that, even if it is through a comms device, it's nice to see him interact with other characters that he hasn't before, in this case, Ada. Um, and 
it brings to life some of that background law that maybe we did or didn't have at the, but we do have now at least it brings it to life a little bit more by having those characters actually interact in a video game for the first time I think at this point because obviously Umbrella Chronicles comes later and so on um, but you know yeah, we had, we'd had implications I think we'd only had yes. implications that they'd had through files through uh, epilogues through all sorts of mm. things you know yeah um, for the performance yeah I mean it's interesting because this one sort of not just a case of where's Wesker after Code Veronica, but when this comes out, it's like, this feels like a different guy again. Like, we've kind of backtracked back to sort of cold thinking on your feet, calculating, keeps his temper completely under control. I mean, obviously, it's a very different situation because he is just in his chair. So, but uh, this is a, a very different guy to, you know, separate laugh man, <laughs> which, um, you know, maybe maybe scarier as well because because he's very under control regardless of what potentially happens along the way there he's able to pivot i think the only evil laugh we get is at the end of assignment ada um but other than that yes he's very classic wesker calm cool and collected um so yeah it fits closer to re1 and remake than cv which is really interesting um uh, steve how do you feel about wesker and resident evil 4 Say so nail meat head, really. You just kind of said it there. It's more the through line between RE1 and its remake counterpart. Mm. And, and for that, I appreciate it. The, the man in the chair state, there's something about it that generally gives me the vibes of is he playing a strategy game or something? Is it like an FMV guy? Like, yeah, go take out that base, get command and conquer. <laughs> That's what he feels like to me. It just feels like a talking head barking orders at Ada. But when Ada says anything, it's like, no, kill Leon. <laughs> Carry on with the mission. I like that to him. Like, the. the Compared to the CV stuff, as we've said, he's a lot less animated and for the better. Although, uh, again, it, I at one point thought, is he actually on that satellite? <laughs> that was dumb. <laughs> uh, yeah, a young, dumb kid. But uh, in comparison, you mentioned it, Simon Ada, who does feel a slightly different character. I know it's, all, it's a non canon minigame, yeah. but it's a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Generally speaking, though, I like this version of Wesker. It's not my favourite by any stretch of the imagination, but the, the way he's implemented here is basically the background guy, the, the post-credits Marvel villain only is throughout the entirety of the second campaign. Mm. It works. Um, I don't know if it's like generally going to be accepted nowadays, but for the time, it was like, whoa, I get to work for Wesker and I'm getting told what to do the entire time. Boy, he is such a whiner. Uh, <laughs> That's I know. fair. That's fair. Uh, yeah, I, I do appreciate that the, the, the complexity of the relationship, though. It's not just a simple yes, sir, no, sir, Ada rebels. Mm. But that's more of an Ada's character traits thing than a Wesker thing. Yeah. No, it's a good point, though. Like, I do feel like maybe this feels a bit of a letdown after CV, like Romby said. But you make a good point there's a different take on it like working for mm. Wesker that's quite an interesting thing that I hadn't considered and an interesting way I suppose to use that character that feeds into it, interacting with someone that we'd never seen before that's interesting too that the, the comment about um, Ada's I guess agency over Wesker's the, the, the other thing that I perhaps in hindsight now hearing that it's like maybe I didn't come across like perhaps it has come across in other versions as Wesker seems to be smart enough to be one step ahead of most people's um, expectations. And in that version, it, it, it's not like he doesn't expect Ada to do things by not listening to her, to him or, or mm. doing something different, but he never really expresses this so much. Whereas in other versions, he, when someone doesn't do what he's expecting, he kind of expresses it a lot more, mm. like his displeasure. Whereas he's much, that's another thing where he's very much more calm and collected here about when she doesn't do what, what he's expecting. Mm. There's no like Which sneers I, of frustration or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He just kind of, he pivots and tries to move on and finds another tactic and con continues to try and keep control where yeah. like there are moments where Wesker and other ones will actually get frustrated at someone yeah. not listening or not doing or doing something unexpected or like the Alexia thing in Code Veronica or, you know, um, the reactions that you get, um, somewhat somewhat to chris and stuff in certain situations so mm. i like that that's like you said with the if going way back to the first game the the the, the kind of the correct cracks and the cool veneer mm. um with the where the actual uh attitude comes through a little bit yeah okay cool well rob you said about uh the remake of resident evil 4 so let's again flip the script round and talk about this version of wesker the latest version of the character, the latest portrayal, uh, Craig Bernatowski, who I love, by the way. I think it's great that he gets to play the character because he has a history with Resident Evil. He worked on the Outbreak games and so on. Um, and 
obviously big shoes to fill uh, following an actor who played the character for a very long time for a great number of appearances um, was always going to be tough I really like him as Wesker because it, the smarminess is there a little bit but the, how he's got a bit of grit to his voice as well which I really like he sounds a bit tired of it all and sort of sick of dealing with other people you know <laughs> he's on his last nerve with humanity he's above everyone else um it's it's good that's what you want out of this kind of villain that's what you want out of wesker uh, steve how do you feel about remake fours wesker generally speaking i feel like the dust has got to settle a bit but i am very that's happy fair, with it completely like uh, especially the the interval scenes when he's actually gone out of his way to help ada like mm. that was something that i never would have pictured wesker doing but they do it in such a way that i can kind of believe it and sells it the actual voiceover performance and personality of it is a it's almost feels like a blending of every variant he's not like completely gone off the deep end he's not incredibly sadistic but you can tell there's like that underlying tension to him mm. but he also has that air of control so it's right now i'm not going to say it's you know it's peak you know it's it's great but it's like it, it's definitely up there mm -hmm. definitely a strong strong performance especially for like you said it doesn't get a lot of screen time even though he's like the big the big draw for a lot of people is oh Ari engine wesker Ooh, ah. yeah um and he also has a pretty cool fit he does Just saying. The outfit, just look pretty the good. That's what I was going to thank you for bringing that up. That's what I was going to get to. Yeah, like to see the blue return to his outfit here is really, really nice. I really yeah. like this I, outfit. It's cool. And the fact that you can don the Dark Legacy classic costume as well um, is really nice. Nice touch. Uh, what you guys were saying about sort of his interactions with Ada in the last game, almost being kind of muted, maybe, like the way that he doesn't react to her sort of doing unexpected things as you put it rob uh this one he feels very much at odds with ada here steve you just mm. he'll help her out but for his own goal and you can tell they really don't trust each other um rombie how do you feel about this version of wesker uh, it took me a while to warm to it um yeah. i think it, th that was the thing i was a little bit this is quite different and i mean if, if people go back and listen to the when we did the review for the remake for on the resident evil podcast i think i was slightly uh, for separate ways i think i was slightly not derogatory but i was a little bit like i, I, I really didn't particularly like it at first but the more i've gone back and rewatched some of those scenes afterwards i've kind of gone okay this is the take and it's a bit like steve said it's kind of that that blend between all the different versions and i start to realize uh that that it's a, a much more nuanced and better performance than i originally gave it for because i was so focused on the interactions feeling off i think that's the bigger thing for me it's not the that the interactions are bad but I, I i posit the question and i did that then too and i still do it now if wesk is so close to this island why is he not why did he send Ada and doesn't trust ada why would he send ada in to do the job for him anyway mm -hmm. she doesn't have any curry any more favor than um he would she she causes chaos wherever she goes mm -hmm. he would do the same it's not mm -hmm. like she's in there being a, like a, a spy she hasn't gotten in you haven't got the jack krauser thing going on anymore in there either so <clears throat> where he's you know manipulating that situation so he has less reason to not just go in and take it for himself he's got his abilities he's got his powers unless there was some plot related reason why like you know we could go back to saying the <clears throat> the, the the suppressants that he's been taking um have, have uh, rendered some of his powers inconsistent or there's some medical reason there's no real reason for him to not just come charging flying in matrix style and like <laughs> you know speeding through and grabbing what he needs and mm. that's the biggest problem for me with the the way with putting him in the situation it's great when they interact i love the scenes where there's a particular one where they're up on top of the tower and and talking between that's a great scene and i love the writing of it but again i'm still sitting there just going why is he not doing it himself at this point he's really frustrated with her um you know it doesn't make any sense now narratively i can see you've constructed this to fit the gameplay and what we expect to play of ada in this but it doesn't make logical sense from a character standpoint and so i very much find the difficult between what is good acting and good writing and good interaction yeah. with what is a dis disconnect between that and the actual situation that's taking place now that you've put him in the action would you argue too much fan service is probably the issue yeah and as i said i think they're trying to justify it's a bit of that and also trying to justify the disconnect as i said in the original version where 
um, he's a little bit too trusting of Ada and she kind of gets away with anything. You, you kind of start to feel like him being close by is to keep an eye on her, but then you still beg back to the question of like, well, then why aren't you doing it yourself if you don't trust her this much? Mm. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's a very hard thing. For, but from a performance standpoint, I, as I said, I've warmed to it a lot more and I'll be interested to see um, if they do more with it. Um, I won't go ahead on that because obviously there'll be a point of discuss discussion, mm. but um, I'm, I'm very much interested to see what happens next if they, if they continue down this path. Yeah, I, for what it's worth, hugely agree. I can also absolutely basically see the boardroom when they're all talking about Resident Evil 4 Remake. We're going to have Wesker in separate ways. But in the original game, he's just in a little box and talks to you and tells you what to do. We can't have Wesker in the RE engine and just have him in a little box. Like, of course, they had to have him in some kind of scenes. So I think that's really what it comes down to is like we've got to reintroduce him a little bit now we're doing the remakes, you know, new face, new voice, new fans. Um, it's it's just a shame because, yeah, you're right, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you start to think about it even slightly, unfortunately. Um, and, and to that token as well, if they were going to do this, yeah, it would have been nice for them to come up with some kind of reason, but also it would have been nice for them to do something new as well on top of it. Like to actually... They've cut off the the Krauser thing, I guess, or or they've just not referenced it whatsoever. That that's kind of a still of a question for me with with Krauser's story as it stands now, of course, and uh, his relation to Wesker and stuff like that. But if that was still established, we'd love to have seen those two characters interact for the first time. Mm -hmm. It would have been something cool for them to do. But obviously, with the state that it's being in, it's kind of a yeah, it's kind of a moot point. But yeah, it's it's unfortunate because I can understand their reason, but it doesn't. It doesn't click. It doesn't doesn't really make any sense. But there you go. Clearly, the you other... need another scenario. We need sunglasses ways <laughs> or something to that effect. Well, that, well that, that's where I was going. This is the other thing I think they missed a the trick at this point is that um, it, what could have been also very interesting is like one of the points where Ada, you end up just getting rescued by Wesker instead of you just being a scene and he rescues her. All of a sudden, you're playing as Wesker for a, a you know a twenty minute section yeah, of the game. Yeah, cool. Yeah would have been that would have i would have been like okay this justifies it a bit more because you did something interesting and different with it mm. and yet yeah, doesn't answer all the weirdness as to why he's doing not doing it himself because now you are actually doing this but he does it anyway so having him playable for a section would have been a nice little surprise for even if he said it, it was like only 10 15 minutes mm. yeah like the sherry segments or whatever you're in the previous games mm, exactly um, the ashley segment yeah I want to just uh, reiterate one last thing, as it is fresh in my mind. The only real performance issue I have with this is still that ending sequence, actually. Like, um, while we're talking about RE4 Remake Wesker specifically, mm. I hate the billions line. I absolutely despise that whole, like, you know, yeah, there's actually going to be billions of people. It just seems too sinisterly smug. And obviously, I know they're leading into five with it. I think that's the, way, the one small part of the performance that kind of annoys me. But I suppose more writing. Mm. Um, generally speaking I know it's probably not a big thing but it bothers me and I have to mention it that's fair in terms of uh, you know I've got a little thing that I must mention before we move on and I'm sure we talked about this on the separate ways pod but gotta mention it here I love that when he does touch down and you get to actually see him in a cutscene there's a musical reference to Resident Evil 1 and they play Wandering About in the background. Mm. And so that's awesome and I love that kind of thing. No, that's the kind of fan service I'm here for. Um, but yeah, needs mentioning because it gets me every time. Um, <clears throat> okay, I have a chunk of lore between Resident Evil 4 and Resident Evil 5, so please bear with me. Eventually, and inevitably, Wesker took de facto control over the rival company. His goal now was a resurrection of the Umbrella Corporation in his own image with himself standing at the top of the world. However, over time, the strings of Project Wesker began to tug at him subconsciously as it had over the years. All Wesker children were subliminally programmed to seek out their master, which manifested itself as a growing anxiety in each of the subjects. By 2006, Wesker's obsession had manifested to the point where he had practically drained the rival company using its finances and resources to track Spencer down, all without avail. It was only when Spencer wanted to be found and his butler passed his location to Irving, who passed it to Ada Wong, and then finally to Wesker, did Wesker finally find what he was searching for. One autumn night in 2006, Wesker finally returned to Spencer and learnt the truth of his existence from his so-called father. Spencer had lured Wesker back in the hopes that they could put the past behind them and forge a new alliance to complete the Wesker Children project and install Spencer as their new god. But enraged at Spencer's arrogance with about the matter, Wesker murdered him in cold blood. This night also saw the apparent death of both himself and Jill Valentine. 
Spencer's revelation had only brought to the surface what had been Wesker's goal all along, which was mass extinction and the forced evolution of humanity. At this point, under the veil of death, Wesker swapped sides again to use Tricell to pursue the desire he'd inherited from his father figure. To continue Spencer's plan, Wesker also needed the progenitor virus, but its source location had always been top secret. But after recovering Spencer's notebook from the estate, he was able to track down a high-ranking surviving formula former Umbrella um, employee and extract the info through interrogation. He now knew the source of the location to be a Western Africa region, Kajuju. By now, Excella Gioni was now a leading figure in Tricell and uh, Wesker persuaded her to take over the position of, com of the company CEO for the entire African division. Once this was done, Excella had Tricell Africa excavate, reopen and expand the old Umbrella facility built beneath the ancient Endopia kingdom near Kajuju. Once they gained access to the progenitor virus in the stairway to the sunflowers, Wesker had Tricell scientists go to work on his doomsday weapon, Uraburos, which was designed to weed out the dregs of humanity with only those possessing superior DNA eligible to cross over into the new age that Wesker now envisioned. That's quite a lot of words. <laughs> Um, also, it's worth saying, of course, that the initial problems of the virus were that it was too poisonous and the mortality rate for those infected was far too high. So Wesker used antibodies from Jill to help neutralize some of the potency of it. In the meantime, he had Irving create new BOWs using less plugas and sell them on the black market to generate continued funding for the Ouroboros research. And in 2009, the virus was perfected and Wesker was ready to take over the world. And here we are at Resident Evil 5, the final appearance of Albert Wesker. Um, I think one that is massively divisive. I mean, the game is massively divisive, but so is Wesker because it's incredible, really, because if you were to Google Albert Wesker, I imagine most of the images are going to come up are from Resident Evil 5. And part of that, of course, is that it's the best-selling game in the series. Sort of, funnily enough, to go back to the news, what we were talking about with all the different versions adding up. But, you know, just in general, it was in its launch version for a very long time. Um, and in gaming in general, yeah, he's this is the this is the Wesker I think that probably most people would think of. But in the community, very controversial because at this point we talked a lot about the amping up of the scenery during bombast of Wesker. Now we really rip the band aid band aid off and go full supervillain. Uh, Rob, how do you feel about Resident Evil Five Wesker? Oh, that's a complicated topic. Yeah, isn't it? Um... It, yeah, the the sneering, snarling, over the topness of it. it, it 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 works. I mean, it's the first thing I you know I'm constantly. The, if you say to me Resident Evil Five Wesker, the first thing I hear is Chris, like just <laughs> through the roof. Yeah, and then obviously the uh, saturation line. I mean, I I remember going okay, so the the game has gone like full. Like they went with this action like over overload so they went we need this big bombastic villain we've gone past pantomime we're going into full like scenery chewing endless spouting <laughs> rage monstering like madness and i think for the context of the game it works perfectly i think i think the performance works perfectly for what was intended i yeah. think from a perspective that's why people remember it because it, it fits tonally with the game that you're playing but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what wesker is or uh you know or should be and um whether or not it's anywhere near the best performance just because it's per per performing what it needs to be doesn't mean make it great <laughs> right. so I, I feel i feel a very much like a lot of the community i feel a very mixed response to five i mean i know five was a hard game to develop after four they were like how do we follow that up like mm -hmm. mikami had left um he'd gone off and done clover and then clover shut it he'd left a lot of the team had disbanded they'd gone to clover as well there was a lot of new staff members working on that project and the producer who had had you know, obviously a long history with the franchise still was very daunted by even taking on that mm. game so it feels like it, it that, that sort of like okay one of the key ideas is we're going to have we need to finally pay off the chris wesker thing so that's obviously a very much a key part of that whole storyline and yeah it works on that narratively as well but yeah, I can see why it's not both loved and not loved at the same time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, for what it's worth, you're right. Like The voice actor's portrayal here is really good of the material that he was given. There's no denying that he puts in 
a classic performance, regardless of how you might feel about the usage of the character. Because there's a lot that I don't like about it as well. I think the accent gets more insane the further you go into the game. It just sort of completely loses itself. It bounces around all over the place. His pronunciations of certain sounds in this are just so ludicrous and it feels all very inconsistent. But maybe it kind of works because it's massively quotable. Said the saturation, seven minutes and all this. And there's loads of stuff in this is as quotable. And just like I said about the Code Veronica Wesker, I think it was. It, it, you could argue that he embodies the B-movie style that is still in Resident Evil's DNA. Like he's just a ridiculous VH, you know, straight to VHS movie villain. Um so in in that ways, yeah, like doing a great job. It's not what I want a Wesker personally. And Resident Evil Five continues to be a game that's very hard to nail down how you could potentially feel about it because it's such an odd one, given its context and everything else. Um, Steve, how do you feel about uh, this particular Wesker? Boy, he sure does feel like the final boss, doesn't he? <laughs> like, yeah, give it that much. That, that's that's what I get the vibe from him most of the time. Uh, I I like. When he's used in the back in the flashback scenes, he doesn't really say anything. He's just a menacing aura, and he fights mm. Chris and Jill. Like you know, I think the most he says to Spencer is that right is now mine. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, generally speaking, though, when he's not engaging, when he, we, the only relationship you see really is him and Excella, and those scenes, there's like a creepy aura going on. Yeah. Like you know, he is aloof ambivalent does not give two hex what she thinks and she's falling all over him obviously for whatever reason she clearly has the hots for leather daddy not that leather daddy different leather daddy <laughs> uh and the, perhaps you have like some of these things like that those moments i think are fine they are they feel on point wesker is a completely does not care about anybody thing mm -hmm. when they become the snaring like crown and all this lot that's when you start to lose me and this is just boiling over into it's just James Marcus's son it's the James Marcus in him that's coming out <laughs> you know his early days studying under him oh yes a world will burn inferno hate very nice good good plan very well thought out <laughs> totally logical um, this is clearly where we were going and Chris, <laughs> like, and Chris laughing at him obviously as well like, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's probably what sends him over the edge uh, that, 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 that's the thing that gets me the, the, the thing that annoys me now and in, in, with the, the, the context of everything we know his you know not his entire life story but enough that it builds to this that, that this is his ending mm. this is how it's going to go mm. this is his final moments like he has some really slick fight scenes and choreography and stuff. Not going to take it away from that. Like the, the way he animates, the way he moves, the way he behaves. Generally speaking, intimidating. That entire engagement on the plane, you know, it sounds some stupid dialogue, is like uh, riveting to watch, mm -hmm. like to engage with, to get murdered by 14 times at four in the morning. <laughs> like, but generally speaking, this is how Wesker's story ends. He's go, he's. Cr basically bawling, screaming in a volcano about how the, the, he, the world requires judgment. It's not really the same man you meet in the mansion lab yeah, in RE1, what, is it? Absolutely. And that's what, what annoys me. Yeah, it's what you I know. was saying earlier. Like, It's so funny to think this is the don't open that door guy. And here he is, as you say, full of tentacles in a volcano. <laughs> yeah. Take away any point where Wesker and Chris are on screen together, and it's just Wesker and Exceller or something like that. Mm. It feels like Wesker. When mm. it's not, it feels like every villain after Wesker. Yeah, very well said. Lots of great points. I do. I did also have a similar thing where it's like, you know, you could argue that he sort of loses it after he kills Spencer and sort of takes on that mantle and that goal. That's when he becomes the supervillain character. Um... But, <laughs> you know... I headcanon that, to be fair. I headcanon yeah. that he kills Spencer and his brain just snaps. I I, I would agree, but it's still... <laughs> it's still, it's still, it's still headcanon. It's still too much for me. Uh, yeah, I, the, the other thing about it that I find quite interesting is, generally speaking, outside of pro wrestling, I'm not really a massive fan of making villains the super cool guy. Not that I think he is. He's a weirdo supremacist. But... There's an element of that. That's what they're going for, you know. As you said, slick, super-powered, long black coat, cool fight scenes that they literally just sh shot for shot for one of the movies at one point. Because I'm going to throw my sunglasses at you, and you're going to catch them, and then I'm going to 
hit you and then I'm going to catch them as they fall out. Like, that's just... The dude catches rockets that you fire at him. He's very clearly meant to be cool, which I don't really like. Like, just make him hateable. <laughs> like, as I said, the guy's a supremacist. Make him, you know, Nikolai's kind of cool in, like, you love to hate him kind of way. This feels a bit more, like, intentionally, like, he's a cool guy. It's the 2000s. He's edgy and he wears a lot of black and he likes the Matrix. I know it never really worked for me. It was like... It doesn't feel completely, even though he's a ridiculous supervillain. It's try it, it tries too hard to be a bit cool uh, for me. Yeah, I was about to say that the way your summary is, it's just trying too hard. It's, yeah, yeah. It, 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 the the best scene for me in that game is the Jill reveal, yeah. like the conversation around Jill and how Wesker and Chris interact in that scene is probably the one where he's not the sneering villain. But he's kind of still he's still being superior, and it kind of works. It's it flashes mm. and shades of uh, the old whisker in that scene. Yeah, and 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 there's more of that in that one sequence than there is for the rest of the game, mm. where whisker feels like he's like I've had power over you the whole time, and you had no idea. Kind yes. of thing. You know, I, and um and the, whereas the rest of him turns back into that yeah, ridiculously over the top sneering supervillain thing. Yeah, that scene really I hadn't thought about it, but it really feels like what we were talking about before with the tyrant scene it's very much like that it's all everything slows down and it's about these characters in this room and yeah he's just so cocky about it i love also the shot uh when he comes down the stairs and there's like a pan up of him and it starts off slow and then it zipped up to his face something really cool about that shot as well but um okay cool well that is every wesker appearance to date canonically speaking um in terms of games at least uh let's wrap up by talking about a couple of things I mean, my first question, this might be difficult to answer. What's your favourite Wesker appearance out of all the ones we talked about? What one do you... What comes to mind first? Might not necessarily be your favourite. Uh, Rob, what the, what's the standout and what's your favourite? Oh, see, this is the thing. As much as I'm not a fan of uh, Code Veronica as a game, I think the Code Veronica appearance has just really stuck with me and still mm. have <clears throat> his, his first appearance with Chris um, in particular, like just, just the way he presents himself. And then again, the Code Veronica X ending. The, the, I just, I, yeah, I like that. I like that thing where you've gone from him being slightly cool and calm to basically... W- reveling in the new power that he's gained but not to the point where he's a sneering over the top supervillain there's a there's a balance between those two things and you mm. see shades of it um and you still see shades of it even in remake four as we we're talking about where they're trying to balance those two things together and i i think co veronica is particularly as i said not the first game i'm going to pick up and play but it's definitely the first thing i, I think of when i think of wesker um and then i'll go back to the og re1 version that yeah. my two favorite appearances really they're they're just they're just like the the right bread and butter to me i'm actually pretty much exactly the same like my favorite sort of interpretation of wesker is the original in the sense that i like him just being just this sort of twisted turncoat dude smug power hungry guy um that's my favorite version of wesker because unfortunately after that point yeah things just get progressively not progressively weirder because it sort of ebbs and flows as we talked about sometimes he's more bombastic than he might be in his next appearance which is interesting i think the arc overall i guess kind of works there are definitely things that i would like to be different um and i really do like as i said richard was code veronica wesker is great for what it is um my 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 favorite version of wesker would be the normal sort of human before he comes back from the dead but I think Code Veronica for me just pips it as well, just for the the greatness of the performance and how it fits into the game, and um, the, even as you said, Rob, how they kind of spoiled the return, which would have been awesome to have that experience for the first time. It's still a cool moment when he does sort of swan back in, uh, as I said, the ghost from the past and all that. Steve, what's your your favourite Wesker of the lot? When Sai asks this question, mention 10-year-old Steve is what I've got as notes. Um, <laughs> so generally speaking, no. obviously 10-year-old Steve's favorite is OG, OG Wesker. I think early on I did say how much I, uh, I'm a big fan of Peter Jessup's Wesker, generally speaking. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, whenever I think of Wesker, two voices appear in my head depending on what era it is. Mm-hmm. If we're talking post-resurrection era, it's, you know, that, that voice actor has caused a bit of trouble of late. And if it's pre that, it's Peter Jessup. 
But I kind of like Pablo Kuntz Wesker a lot even now because it, maybe it's because I've been watching him and his son play the games as well. And it's, 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 it's heartwarming to see that he's taken to playing through the entire franchise that he really had a foundational footnote in. Mm. I kind of would like to see what Pablo could do with proper voice direction in the modern age. So I'm going to just, just say that version of Wesker for 10-year-old me and for Pablo now. Nice. Uh, of course, to, to really cap this whole thing off, I have to ask the dreaded question is, do you think that we'll have a Wesker return? I'm not just talking about a Resident Evil 5 remake, but obviously that is definitely a route. And maybe that's where you want to take it. Do you think that maybe he survives at the end of a Resident Evil 5 remake? Do you think he's coming back into the series in one form or another? Umbrella, Core, obviously set something up which hasn't been necessarily delivered on. There are many routes. Do you think it's going to happen, Steve? It's, I hate to say this. I really, really, really cannot understate how much I hate to say this, but it feels like it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. And that, that annoys me. That annoys me so, so much because we really should have built up a new villain by now. You know, uh, for, for context sake, you know, yes, Batman fights the Joker a lot, but there's also Mr. Freeze. Yeah. There's also Poison Ivy. You know, th there are other villains we could have probably established and built on them you know, put enough foundational work in, but because there isn't anyone else to fall back on, I mean, the closest competitor is Alex Wesker in the yeah. body of a, or admittedly not 13-year-old child now. It, it, the thing is, it annoys me because wh how are you going to justify bringing a man dead who's been decapitated by two rockets who was in a, having a lava bath at the time <laughs> without it being ridiculous? Like, coming back from the dead from being impaled and in an exploded mansion was ridiculous. Or being jobbed off by some cameos in the power room. We don't talk about that. <laughs> you know, it's, they they really needed to have built a better villain by now, and they've not. Yeah. Like Morgan, what's his face from the FBC? Uh, he's probably in a jail somewhere. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, you've got. Uh, I suppose Frederick Down Downing looks like Wesker if you squint. He's like a player <laughs> two outfit <laughs> for him. Yeah, get the hair dye. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Nikolai is the only other competitor and his motivation is money so you need to find a really good way to rope him back in uh, which unfortunately leaves us with sooner or later Wesker's back and we're all going to sigh over it Just, no. yeah. I'm sad now I, I think probably the same to be honest um, I there's a horrible part of me that I feels like the day after that if it ever happens that a Resident Evil 5 remake does occur um, a part of me wonders the next day are we all going to wake up and see the internet's exploded because in the final scene Wesker caught the two rockets and threw them away and got out and lived and you know trundled off I make it sound like I hate Wesker or something and, uh, I want to just yeah no no it's fine I mean I know exactly what you're saying I completely agree like the fact that the series has to go backwards now uh, to get a villain if that if indeed that's what's going to happen I've been playing a lot of Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth recently so maybe we're going to find out that the remake sort of canon is its own thing and Wesker has come back to rewrite <laughs> history <laughs> like that's what a, it's all been leading to this he knows what's about to happen and he's going to prevent it by catching the rockets as I say and then stomping off mad and, and then coming back and in, a, in a new timeline I'm, I'm obviously being silly and facetious but I do think that it's kind of inevitable. I, whether he survives the end of Resident Evil 5 remake, I don't know. But I think there's going to be... We've not seen the last of Wesker. We can absolutely say that in some form or another. Rob, it where do you land on this? It was a clone. It was also <laughs> absolutely a possibility. Where do you land on this, Rob? I was going to say I was going to make the clone joke just then you you, you stole it from me because I was going to say he's going to he's going to be a clone Sorry. he's going to eat and he's going to have a passion for breadsticks. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I I this is this has been a controversial talking point no matter where you go and I know even on the Resident Evil podcast which it's 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 like a bad thing to even like oh, yeah. bring up the idea of of Wesker's re resurrection. Um, I mean, I think it's it's a difference to standpoint if they remake Resident Evil Five and the narrative stays the same, he still dies. But I think you guys have hit the the the, the nail on the head that the the idea of the, the every villain since has been like a villain of the week. There hasn't been a continual run of like here's a villain that we're building up to have over multiple games in a way that actually is sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I think they are lamenting the idea that they've never been able to do that. I mean, even when they you get a bit of a crossover, it's literally because of circumstances. You look the the the, the slight connections between. Uh, 
seven and eight, you know, with the molds because they've got this ability to have this consciousness thing that they managed to get, you know, Evelyn back in. And um, it's it, it's kind of a weird place to put yourselves. And, and this is a franchise that has constantly reinvented itself. Um, but then has now, I don't want to say stagnate because that's not the right word because clearly these remakes are selling, but we're getting to the point where we've remade almost half of the main line titles. Yeah, yeah. So if you do a Code Veronica or a five, then it's more than half. And then like, how much do you want to rechange? And, and, and right now at this point, the narrative has in some ways the remakes have simplified things of their own versions but they've stayed relatively true to the origin so nothing's really drastically changed but if you go to the end of five and you change the outcome with Wesker not dying that is a huge change that sets up very different stakes post Resident Evil 5 essentially um, and I don't know if you can narratively connect that to what happens later in like seven eight and the Neo and Umbrella and you know like right. all the and blue umbrella and all these things that have happened if Wesker survives. Yeah, agreed. That it very much changes things. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting topic because on one, the one hand, you probably do want Wesker back as far as like we want something compelling as a villain, but you don't want Wesker back because it's stupid and makes no sense and it would be <laughs> dumb. And like He's people died just three upset. times, is that not enough? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, do we need to really bring him back again? Mm. Um, and then when he does come back, what sort of villain is he going to be? I think we we will see him in the sense that if they make a Resident Evil Five remake, and I just hope that they just stick with the original and yeah. he dies by the end. I don't care if it's not two rockets to the head and a lava bath. I just <laughs> expect that he will he will be be vanquished by the end of it, and mm. um and and that will that will be it. Um, I mean, I think the more interesting thing for me is uh, uh, going back to the Code Veronica thing is if they did a Code Veronica remake as well. I mean, there's opportunity to flesh out the character there. I I, I got far too excited about the HCF reference in 7. Oh, Way too. too excited. Mm. Um, and so I think there's a, a very much a chance to kind of tell a little bit of that narrative, that gap that exists between the original Resident Evil and up until Resident Evil 4 by fleshing out the whole background of Wesker and HCF and everything that he was doing in that time um, through a remake. And I think that's where I'm narratively the most interested in maybe Wesker returning again. Mm -hmm. But but that's it for me. I, other than that, no. I, I, I hope not. And to extend his life beyond the realms of the timeline that he exists in would be terrible. Yeah. And of course, it's worth saying that, I mean, you could perhaps tell, tell the story for the... For... I don't want to say for the new audience, as if us old players aren't going to pick it up anyway. But, but you know, the people that play a supposed Resident Evil Five remake that don't have the backstory of Wesker, maybe you could fit it in within that game as well. But for me, it's a weird thing to do because to tell Wesker's story, you really need to do one and CV first. So it's a real long game if they're going to do that. But that's like a whole other thing. Uh, but if they wanted more Wesker, there's three games he appears in that haven't been remade. So you might as well. Do all of them if you're going to, but don't. Play, but I should be very clear: don't do that. <laughs> but <laughs> if I'm, I'm Wesker, very, you know, I'm very, I'm very much of the question that at this point, like people were saying, you know, uh, a Resident Evil One remake, you know, in the remake, the new remakes or second remake is like an an option, mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, a, I don't really want that personally because I think the original remake for 2002 is, I mean, while it's of its time, it's very much a a very near perfect remake of yeah. what its intent was but secondly i think if you're going to do it don't do it that way you i would combine zero and one into one remake mm -hmm. make yeah, it one well, big narrative that that crosses over you get this whole thing with rebecca following through you get more of wesker because his involvement you get the tie over between the two and and, and it becomes like the mansion incident you just mm -hmm. call it like resident evil the mansion incident or something like that and mm -hmm. it becomes like its own narrative if you are going to bother remaking it just don't bother remaking zero by itself or one by itself okay. or combine them into something that makes sense and then you have an opportunity to flesh out whisker in, in that style and the motivations and, and and the things that he's doing in that in that way if you wish to but again i don't want that still they still <laughs> would rather they don't i'm the same as you i'm like Give if you're gonna do it do it this way but yeah. but don't do it this way <laughs> exactly. i think the thing that also I think the thing that also worries me about it, and 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 I will leave this as my final thought on it because of the same thing, is the narrative disconnect that sometimes does happen between even the remakes themselves. Like I really expected 
when they announced Resident Evil 3 as a remake that it was going to be wrapping around 2's remake a lot more because they had the opportunity to do that. But realistically, in the end, it felt just like the original 3 was to the t- to 2, which is like, connectively, it sits in the same locations, but it doesn't feel like those two events had to be con- coexistent. Like, there, there are, there are con- some continuity errors, and even if you ignore those, it doesn't feel like either game is enriched by the other one's existence. You are not getting a crossover. I mean, other than Resident Evil 2 getting a patch to add a file of Jill in the gun shop, you know, like, <laughs> it's not like you've you've needed to make these two games connectively, they're independent. And so it doesn't give me, it doesn't bode well for me when, when you have these two games that are so closely linked that you're going to connect them that way. So the chances of a zero one kind of mash is, is not very likely in my mind either for that same reason. Mm-hmm. And it's two bites of the apple if they decide to go down the track too. It's yeah. successful. They do a Co Veronica remake and a five remake and a zero remake and a one re re remake. There's four games, you know, like, mm-hmm. and they've all been so far successful. And, but eventually where does the remake train stop and how many times can you remake a game? And, Oh gosh, I I could go on about this for half an hour. And I don't want. To. I remember. I want to say it was. So I want to say it was stars in one of the ROP episodes that said that yeah, you know, Resident Evil Nine will break ground as being the first remake before its original release. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Nothing else remains for me then to thank our contributors, our patrons, and our listeners. And of course, as I said at the top of the show, the Resident Evil Pod at Resident Evil Pod on social media and Resident Evil Podcast dot com. The guys over there, Batman and Neptune, for their work on the timeline and the encyclopedia, which we have used extensively over the course of the profile series. Uh, join the First Aid Spray Discord server to become part of our community and hear the show only and unedited. And don't forget to follow us all on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. We sort of use Blue Sky a bit now, I guess. All of these links and all of our content can be found at fasprayspod.com. You can listen to the podcast on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and all good podcasting apps. And if you like what you hear, please do leave us a review where you can and spread the good word. Don't forget you can support the show by picking up some merch or at patreon.com forward slash fa spray pod for as little as one dollar a month in our next episode in theory we're going back to resident evil 5 yet again this time the resident evil 5 that never was as we talk about the beta version of the game thank you to the panel you can follow all of us individually i'm at cyniac underscore 123 steve is at fb steve was taken and rombie is at sms and finally thank you for listening have a good week My friend, a postscript that I probably should have sold, that same friend told me that night before when his brother had rented it, they were all gathered in the lounge and they had the lights out and they're playing it. And they were in the the, the hallway, the owl hallway with the dogs in the window. And the dog jumped through the window and they all freaked out. And then they ran, the, his brother's control ran down the hall and went through the door. And just after he was going to the door loading scene, the family dog like sprinted <laughs> through the lounge. <laughs> And scared the bejesus out of everyone, and so they were like, "That made the they were saying to me, that made the game so much better." <laughs> the so, dog was in on it. <laughs> the dog was in on it. So I, I always remember that happening as well. It was like the family dogs freaked out or something. I don't know. What's like the maybe meaning? it was the sound of the dogs. The dog understood the assignment. That's what the meaning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the dog. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>